so easily amused oh my god <laughs> i really do love that sound it gets me so jazz and i don't yeah i don't know what it's about but every time i hear pow, 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 i'm like oh shit it's, no, going, it's down. going down <laughs> <laughs> oh empathy i miss oh, you i miss you i have i talked to you in a while i don't I remember don't, anymore probably but like it never i feel like we just kind of lose track of uh we go and- we go through spurts for people wondering if we're just like always talking to each other. We go through <laughs> spurts of talking non fucking yeah, stop, right. and then we go through spurts where it's like I probably have not heard from you in like five days. No, it's and true. I- it's like manic phases where we like can't stop telling each other everything, and it'll be like four a.m. and I'll be like, also this, and then yeah, there'll or be like, like a I'll break. break. I like to I like to Facetime Christine when I'm peeing. So uh, yeah, Em used to accuse me of calling when they were peeing, and now it's like. Guess you what did, I'm but doing. then it, it, it made me feel safe. So then I started doing Wait, it. Back. It's a Pavlovian <laughs> response. Every time you yeah. people, you're like, time to call Christine. <laughs> every every time I make peeps, I'm like, I just gotta think of Christine. <laughs> but yeah, now I now I FaceTime you, and that's what I tell you all my drama. And it's I a good love time. that time. It's potty time. It's my favorite yeah, time. I love potty time. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Empathy, why do you drink yeah. this week? I know you told me to ask, and I'm very intrigued. Um, although well, that, I was intrigued, and then you were like, it's a story about my glasses, and I was like, oh. Oh boy, here we go. Well, it's not even that interesting, but I just, I, I mean, do... I know that's kind of why I'm not as thrilled as I was hoping. It's a mundane thing to be upset about, oh, uh, at least to me, but my, I've had these glasses for, I can't even tell you how long. And, uh, they're just getting to the point where they are nearly unusable. Like I'm currently looking through like clouds right now to Uh-oh. be able to see, like, it's just, my lenses are so fucking scratched and like, I just need new glasses and I'm not looking forward to the process because it's an expensive process because well, you have the the special need special like eye needs <laughs> yeah I do have special eye needs <laughs> I have uh yeah I wear trifocals yeah which means there are three individual prescription lenses in each side on each L-O-L. side of my eye L. and so uh they are very 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 pricey which means I'm gonna have to commit to like I gotta go get my vision tested a million times to double- make check or to make sure that each prescription is right before they put them on the glasses and then might as well go find new frames. But then, then I have like my ADHD overwhelmed, like, do I stick with what I know and feel safe with, or do I get a whole new pair of glasses? Because since I have trifocals, I got to commit to this frame, these frames for like five years. And it's, it's a lot. So anyway, I'm, I'm struggling currently. Well, if you want, you could go back and listen to the episode that I remember very clearly editing, which I believe was our crossover with wine and crime, where you complained about your glasses falling apart, where you needed new glasses. So maybe you can go back and listen and get inspired about the cycle of how these glasses tend to go for you. We probably weren't even that close with wine and crime yet. And that's just what they remember me. It's just so funny because I remember like they were like telling some story, some like wild tale. And then it was like, my glasses are so so embarrassed. No, don't be. I just remember editing it down and being like, wow, they probably were like, um, is this, is this, is this leads to your drinking problem, everybody? Well, Um, uh, speaking of wine and crime, it is Kenyon's birthday, by the way. I know. I know. Uh, Didn't you see her for 4th of July? We never heard about this. I never talked about that. She visited um, with her husband because they both, they moved to Kentucky the week I moved to Kentucky. I moved from LA to Kentucky. She moved from South Africa to Kentucky. And we both moved the same week and like, we had no clue. It was so bizarre. I just remember being like, this is the weirdest coincidence. What was the hangout time. like? Oh, it was so fun. They came up for 4th of July. Um, I had a little barbecue and my family was, it was, I felt kind of bad. Cause I was like, oh, so Renee got sick. So she didn't make it. So I was like, it's like my family. So oh. come over and hang out with my family, <laughs> but it was super fun. Um, and they were great. And, uh, I served wine and crime wine. Uh, ah, so I was like, so Kenyon, fun. my wine has your, your face on it. Like that's how, <laughs> I was a little much probably, but she brought her dog, Josie and Josie and Gio are really similar looking. So they were like little twins. That's so fun. Um, it was very fun. And I, we just wished you were there and the other wine and crimers were there. Well, we missed uh, you. 
apparently uh amanda and lucy had fomo and so after they found out that y'all were gonna hang out they like drunkenly facetimed me when i was in <laughs> vegas <laughs> so we were all together in spirit but oh you know. that's anyway fun. also what weird i don't think i've ever realized how many similarities the two of you have we're like it you is run a yeah. true crime podcast you have a very similar dog you moved to kentucky from a far distance yes uh, it's weird right and then like um, um I don't need to, I need to air anybody's personal stuff online, but we had some very similar I- I things that happened last year that were like, you know, personal uh, health issues, health issues. Exactly. And so it's just a very weird, like when we, I feel like we had never met up one-on-one before and it was very much like, I don't know. We were like in the same, like headspace. She's probably like, no, Christine, stop. <laughs> she's stop like, I'm not coming back. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it was really fun. Um, and oh, they were, they're coming back. I don't need to tell everybody when they're coming back, but they're coming back soon, uh, to Cincinnati oh, yeah. and they came up to go to Ikea, which is hilarious. Cause like we have a big Ikea here. Um, I used to do that in Virginia. Our Ikea was really? an hour away. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we are, I like never thought of it growing up as like, oh, we're a special place with an Ikea, but it's true. Like there's not one anywhere else around um but so they came up for an ikea for a trip and um they're coming up again for like a i think a bengals game and a reds game or something and we live like again i'm triangulating myself but i live like walking distance from both stadiums girl and i was like this is gonna be so- <laughs> there's a lot okay they're downtown there's a lot of options for walking okay oh but <laughs> girl but just, <laughs> girly pop i can't stop i can't stop um but they're coming and i was so frustrated because it's the exact weekend i'm going to connecticut for um my beautiful mother-in-law's hosting a baby shower which i'm so excited about Aww. and it's so special because i'm going to see all the siblings that we haven't seen because of covid and like it's just going to be really nice but yeah so i'm going to be out of town when they come back but you know they'll be here. So, so sweet. It'll be fun. Anyway, that's all. Uh, I don't really have any other reason I drink except that, um, you know, it's just, I feel really, I feel like a circus tent. I had a maternity photo shoot yesterday, Emothy. What and, does that um, mean? Like a you photo just, shoot. Like, I know, but know. like, how do they pose you? Like, what, what oh, do you just like care? like engagement photos except I have a large stomach I don't know <laughs> <laughs> there's only um, one difference in these I know pictures. I had a prop so she was like well at least you can put your hand somewhere and I was like that's a really good point um, was it weird so here's the thing here's here's my thing yeah when it comes to professional photography right. I'm not I'm not for it because I get I get really stage fright obviously but also I get so in my head about it that it doesn't feel natural at all I already think about like if Allison and I ever get married and we have to have like engagement photos or even photos at the wedding, yeah. like I feel, I would get so nervous at how unnatural they feel. Like, was this like a session where like she made you, where they made you feel like super comfy during the, yeah, I mean, I feel photo? like if, if you go with someone who you don't like, I don't know, feel comfortable talking to or connecting with, maybe it's weird, but I don't know. I mean, I think a professional photographer gets a vibe of like this is what your comfort level is you're not the kind of person like I'm not the kind of person who wants to stand in a field of like sunflowers with like a robe you know and like showing my stomach like that's not my jam so I found a photographer online um I'm sure they'll I'll tag them on Instagram but where they were just like very casual very like down to earth like the photos are all kind of just people like it's not super cheesy you know I'm I mean? I'm thinking I'm thinking sunflowers with a rose. No, no, okay. no, no, no. I don't do that. I can't. I, okay. can't. I mean, I would have been. I mean, let's there put were some it this poses way. Where I was like, this is really embarrassing, and she was like, I know. Just do it for a minute. Like it'll turn out I, better than you think. And I so. very much appreciate when photographers are like, this is gonna feel real it, stupid. But she was like, very upfront about stuff like that. Like just, she was like, lean in, Blaze. I know she's sweaty, and I was like, okay, we don't need to talk <laughs> about my sweat. <laughs> no, but. I. I mean, let's put it this way. A, like when I even think about like engagement or wedding pictures or I don't, I'm only using those because I can't even conceptualize another reason I would need professions. I know when I was uncomfortable the whole time, but not because oh, like, no. not because the photographer did anything just because I hate being in front of a camera, but like even remember I showed you the picture from when I went to Vegas with Allison and we were in the gondola. Yes. Remember oh, that this? was funny. 
like but that was most... weird that was awkward i mean that was made to be awkward like i guess so someone there was a professional photographer there and i guess since you're in a gondola it's supposed to look all romantic and they're like Yikes. oh give each other a kiss and like we had literally never kissed in front of a camera before in four years it's, it's and we were wild. so uncomfortable and that picture just like blew my like we intentionally looked so uncomfortable because we didn't know what else to do so we made an awkward joke out of it but then i think of like what happens when we get married and everyone's like take a picture of you kissing. And I'm like, I you just tell them, I don't do want a photo of us kissing. And they're like, okay, like you're hiring me. If you don't want a photo of you kissing. I mean, mm. yeah, I feel like, I feel like it's just all about communication. Like, I don't know. I think she just got a, I, I, I got a vibe from the photographer. She got a vibe from me. It was sort of like, we're not doing the whole cheesy, like lying down in a angelic outfit, whatever. Like that's just not me. Oh. I didn't hear any of that because my <laughs> and, and literally I started out. speaking about lying down in a field and I was like, I'm unplugging what? my headphones now. <laughs> I don't want to hear any of this. That was God. He was I, like, you don't need this. God was like, you have glasses problems. That's enough for me this week, <laughs> Emily. Um, no, but I, anyway, I'm glad your, your photo shoot went well, but I like immediately just like, I like hope broke, it went well. Question mark. She I just it went well. break into a, a sweat whenever I think about like being put on the spot like that, even if it's like in a comfortable, don't get me wrong. I was nervous. It was, it was out of my like I'm definitely out of my element about like being because we all oh, we also took the photos downtown where the wedding was um so oh. it was like in front of the same building which is kind of cute so it was like all the same spots where we had wedding photos that actually um, makes it very sweet oh wow that's oh, so cool. thank you it was uh it was kind of it was 98 degrees out and it was uh humid as fuck but you know otherwise it was fun time <laughs> oh, good. Uh, I also wore high heels and it was like this is the dumbest thing you've ever done and I was like five minutes later I was like wait You're you chose right. that for yourself yeah. here's the thing I You're all my stupid. Rothy's are fun colors so it didn't match my dress so I had to wear I had to find shoes that were like plain um and they were they were uncomfortable but anyway I'll post those on Instagram eventually when they come in but hopefully unless they're just really unflattering which I don't know <laughs> she seemed to be you know know what she was doing so I don't seemed think to be on her game be, but yeah ah. anyway anyway I <laughs> sorry, to, a sorry to ask I, I will tell you one. Sorry to ask you so many questions. No, I, I, I hear professional I photography it. and I'm like, how did you make that not awkward for yourself? Well, Cause I can't get out of that mental block. What did you think when we had like the wedding photographer? Was that super weird? Or I only really? had to be in like, I only remember being in like three pictures. So I wasn't even really, that I think you were in a lot of deal. group pictures, which maybe is less uncomfortable. Yeah. If it was just the two of us over and over, I would be wild. There were some cute photos of us though, that I've like never really gone through. Cause I've like, 2000 photos but there's some cute ones of us that I should post or pull out or show I'll, you or something I think I just recently sent you my favorite picture from from your wedding but it was like a complete candid there's no way someone could have captured that if we oh. knew it was happening but per the professional pictures there uh do I have it I have it near me it's the one that you framed it's yes. somewhere around here yes, I like that one I a lot where I'm drinking <laughs> yeah <laughs> I know I that's that's one of my favorite pictures of us too so. but also that was candid I think that was one of the pictures where they said like you're gonna look stupid but do this and yes. I really appreciate it I they so. know what they're doing you know I just kind of have to trust them oh, okay here's your story Christy Yay. um also I'm preparing you now because whatever dark shit you're about to talk about in the second <laughs> half of this I would like to know what the size of your baby is because it's all I have to comfort me <laughs> okay I'm going, oh, wait, you want, no, you want to know afterward or now? I want to know after, afterward. Like, so okay. we can end on a high. So you know? we'll have like, we only have a few weeks left of this plan. So uh, we'll lean into it for now. Yeah. We'll lean into it and then we'll have to find something else Fantastic. to size. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, okay. So here's your story. Sweet Christine. Here it is. Oh, you little. Oh, 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 oh. I actually called you gross on TikTok live last night. Wait, so. what? What's TikTok <laughs> live? What? <laughs> like I was on live, I like live streaming on TikTok. <laughs> What? I always miss your fun adventures. I was playing hangman. And one of the things I did was Christine is gross. Okay. So you are a big butthead. <laughs> That's my next hangman. <laughs> um, okay. Here for you. It's not cowboys, but it's the other half of that. What is your favorite? What's your favorite stories? Your aliens. Favorite? Yes. Okay. Yay. Go alien UFOs. Tried to find a cowboy. It did not happen. But I was able to mix it well with one of my favorite things, Canada. So, okay, here we go. Fun. Um, this is the Falcon Lake incident. <gasps> What's that? Fal I like M takes a sip of their tea to like 
have my reaction framed <laughs> between silence. Dramatic pause. Yep, yep, yep. Um, okay. So this, first of all, I want to give a huge shout out to a podcast. I ended up actually just reading the transcript. And so I didn't actually hear, oh. um, I didn't hear what it was called. It's, it's the UFOs at either LAC or the Uf- UFOs at LAC. Cause they would like say the word LAC. Okay. So I don't know which one it is, but that podcast is pretty much most of my notes. So, um, Thank you so much. Like they nailed it. They had Wait, their. Com- oh, that's the name of the podcast. <clears throat> it's the name of the podcast. UFOs at LAC or UFOs at Black. Okay. Um, but they had their it. They had it was a two part episode for the Falcon Lake incident, and they had interviewed actual witnesses and like key witnesses who. Whoa. And it, they had complete transcripts of the whole thing, so it was easy to just read through the interviews and get a lot wow. of information. So shout out to them. Um, and I'm only covering a scratch this, of the surface. So please go listen if you are interested. Um, so the Falcon Lake incident is in Manitoba, Canada, and, which I have three fun facts for you about Manitoba. Oh, hell yeah. One Lay of the on me. Uh, fun facts, one and two, is that it is the polar bear capital <gasps> and the Slurpee capital. Wait, that's so fun. Wait a second. I just got it. The icy polar bear whoa <laughs> I don't know if I got anything but I, I connected Ooh. them in my head no I took like the little b- yeah oh that makes total He's sense an icy I don't know I, ah! I see from Manitoba maybe oh my goodness well it did say slurpy so I'm imagining oh, that's like okay, 7-eleven but maybe slurpy came out and icy was like I'm gonna be your competitor and use our animal you know uh-huh. I don't know there could be some real drama there that we could unpack um fun fact number three is that this story also takes place specifically in winnipeg manitoba Yay. where winnie the pooh is named after <gasps> i didn't know that fun did you know what? that i have like a really deep-seated obsession with winnie the pooh um from when childhood I, interesting when i was a kid i had a deep-seated obsession with tigger oh yeah i had all the old books like the like the old old versions and like all the original like i don't like the newer like disney adapt like yeah yeah, yeah. i like the original classic ones and i got the baby a bunch of little um swaddles that have like the map of the 100 acre (laughs) wood and it says like eeyore's sad place (laughs) that's precious i was gonna say you liked poo i like tigger and i guarantee we're both eeyore now eeyore we we just we tried to ignore it but like we were both eeyore all along yeah um, gender is a construct, so it doesn't matter that he was a boy, but I had the biggest crush on rabbit. And also <gasps> the fact that rabbit had like severe OCD. I was like, absolutely. I can respect this guy. Yeah, I can absolutely. Him. I was like, um, stop messing with his carrots, everybody. Like was, Jesus, he's asking politely to set some boundaries. I thought he like just hung the moon. I thought he was so cool. That's very precious. Also, if anyone goes back and watches my like number one favorite show from like kindergarten to second grade little bear little I bear had, <gasps> i had such a big crush on Wait, didn't cat I, didn't we just talk about little bear i feel like i brought what? up little bear like three weeks ago <laughs> probably i don't know if i mentioned it last time but i had the biggest crush on cat so you didn't mention it i'm so glad to know who I mean, was also did, a boy but... uh-oh Look what's you. happening here well oh. actually it was a cat so i don't know that I that was... matters it doesn't matter it doesn't matter it was a cat i mean Same. i also had a crush on kovu from lion king too the scar's nephew or whatever oh i don't know if i ever saw lion king oh, 2 i was too traumatized you, by lion king 1 <laughs> you would have a very large crush on kovu i promise you okay i think I'm we could agree it. on one thing just go look him up real quick just go look at how do you that k-o-v-u uh, uh, tell me six-year-old you wouldn't okay well the second mind. like fill in the blank on google was like as a human so clearly people <laughs> have tried to make oh this art. is a thing like people love kovu Oh, he's cute. He's a hottie. For a it's lion? Like, yeah. I'm not, I mean, you know, I'm just wow. saying. Ko- Kovu, kindergarten me, he was a smoke show. Okay. <laughs> show. <laughs> okay. Let's Don't look into- up Kovu as a human. It, it got weird pretty fast. <laughs> I am not surprised. All the people Fun who fact. loved Kovu as a child ended up like getting like fan fiction pages. So yeah. Yeah. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> Here we go. So Winnie the Pooh was named after Winnipeg. By okay, the way. That's, that's fun. I did here. not know that. 
So the Falcon Lake incident is one of the most famous cases, probably the most famous case in Canada. Uh, it is one of the top UFO cases out there, and it's been uh, on several TV shows and had a bunch of reenactments and things like that. But it's probably most famed show it was on was the original Unsolved Mysteries. <gasps> classic so and the which by the way was season five episode eight nice at least the version i saw on youtube was that so uh may 1967 is where this takes place my friend and the main character to our story could have different pronunciations to his name because in buzzfeed unsolved they called him stefan mohalik and in Unsolved Mysteries from the 60s, they called him Stephen Mikulak. <laughs> oh, wow. Both are different. Okay. So Stephen Mikulak or Stefan Mahalik, but it's it's the same wow. spelling, different pronunciations. I'm going to run with Stephen Mikulak because even the key witnesses say that the Unsolved Mysteries uh, t- retelling of the story is the most accurate one that they ever saw. Okay. So I, I feel like they at least heard the name Stephen Michalak and they were like that's fine you know that that works we'll take it so <clears throat> Stephen is 51 and this is May 1967 Stephen is 51 he's a mechanic from Winnipeg but he often went to the Falcon Lake woods because of his interest in geology <gasps> um and I guess over there they had a lot of quartz and I apparently if there's quartz. There's also potential for nickel and gold. Um, he also was out there looking for silver and Palm Lake woods was just, I guess, scattered with it. So he went on a little geology excursion. He left really early, like five 30 in the morning. And this is a quote from him. Steven says that when he went to, uh, Falcon Lake woods that morning, he quote, brought a hammer, a map, a compass, paper and pencil, and a little food to see me through the day. Also wearing a light jacket against the morning chill. The day was bright, sunny, not a cloud in the sky. It seemed like another ordinary day, but events which were to take place within the next six hours were to change my entire life for more than anyone could ever imagine. I will never forget May 20th, 1967. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. So while out in the woods, it all starts with geese as it always does. It always does, doesn't it? Just honking around. Always honking. So uh, he hears a sound nearby and it's a bunch of geese that have apparently been startled by something. And when he looks around to see what it was, he sees two objects in the sky. One of them was cylindrical or both of them were cylindrical with humps on them. And they glowed this really bright scarlet red. Mm. And the objects, apparently, as they got closer to him, they switched from being more cylinder shaped to more oval shaped. So I guess they got more egg shaped. Yeah. Um, And as they got closer to him, one of them stopped moving in the sky. The other one that did not stop moving in the sky and kept getting closer and closer to him eventually landed nearby on this kind of rock path or this brush area at the same time. The one in the sky is hovering and not moving. It's just hovering above them and eventually takes off. Meanwhile, Mm. the one that landed starts changing colors in front of him. dear. It starts turning from like a red to a silver to like it's got gold all around it now. Like it's got like an outline. (laughs) Um, Steven says that after like realizing what he was paying attention to and what he was seeing, he very quickly went into like, remember every detail mode. So that <gasps> way he could like try to not forget yes, this. Love that. So smart. He's, he did say that the machine, and I feel like we just covered this with a different UFO story, but he said that he remembers it not looking like it had any joints welded into it. Like it oh. had been pieces put together. It, he said it looked more like one massive piece of steel had kind of been chipped away. So there was one solid object. Weird. That is weird. Which someone else has also just said in a recent story that it looked like really weirdly smooth steel. Okay. Um, so he said the same thing. He also said that there was this warm sulfur smell coming yeah. out of it. Um, it also sounded like a machine was kind of whirring around and he started looking for any identification marks to see like, is this a military craft? Is this is it a, a language? I don't know. And uh, 
eventually, I guess he like, I don't know, bonded with this craft to a point where he felt like he could like sit down and just hang out next to it. So he, okay. <laughs> he sat down next to it. And with the kit he had with his paper and pen, he started drawing the UFO the best he could. Like he, he just, I guess thought like, oh, it doesn't look like it's moving or no one's coming out. I guess I'm just going to sit here with it and sketch it out. Sketch it. Like, paint me like one of your French aliens. I don't know. So <laughs> he, uh, after he sketched it, he sketched it for like a good 30 minutes. Like it was oh, like, Oh wow. This is a full a session, full portrait this, session. This was no stick figure UFO. This was <laughs> like, he drew out, like, um, he tried to draw different sections of it so that we could get like almost a 360 scope of it. I mean, <sighs> Smart. he, yeah. So he was on it and eventually he walks up after he's done drawing, I guess, uh, he got curious and walked up to the UFO and he saw, this part I didn't see in the interview transcript, but I did see in the episode of Unsolved Mysteries. And again, they all said that this was a very accurate retelling. So I'm going to run with it that uh, he walked up to the UFO and the door opens all of a sudden. There's like a hatch that opens up and inside is this bright ass glowing purple light coming from inside. And apparently it's so bright that it's making him see like spots. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He started hearing like little faint voices in there or maybe it was like some sort of high-pitched machinery he didn't recognize but he thought people might be in there um and so he started getting nervous and he shouted at the ufo the sentence okay yankee boys having trouble come on out and we'll see what we can do about it (laughs) which like yankee because like it's in the sky and therefore north? north i don't understand i don't think that's how north works <laughs> i don't understand but he said okay yankee boys having trouble come on out and we'll see what we can do about it apparently he got no response and so he repeated this in polish which i love that wait I- what <laughs> sorry that was the what's He's- the yankee word for or polish word for yankee that's quite I, was gonna a say, I was like why are we i feel like if you if yankee isn't getting a response in english it's probably not going to get a response no in i imagine not but what do i know he then also started speaking russian and then he also said it again in german Okay. Um, okay. So he's at least trying to cover all his base. It's not just like Polish and English. It's like trying to cover the European ground. Just running through the languages here. Like Got what it. a, what a power flex. Uh, cause Seriously. we also, we didn't even mention he's a polyglot. He's just yeah, like, well, Oh yeah. I, I tried it in Russian too. Nothing happened. What if he only knows that phrase though? He's like, <laughs> I just learned Yankee, whatever. <laughs> It's like, I can say, where's the bathroom in like five exactly. languages. The Does that make me a polyglot? Stuff. I don't even know how to say that. I can say like, there is the library, like something so useless <laughs> that like, it's never going to help me. But yeah, maybe he just learned that sentence. I know like a word in about 15 different languages yeah. and therefore I could string them together as the most polyglot sentence of all time. And that a makes sentence, me feel sentence is generous. I don't know if sen- if it would be a more sentence. like a list, like a, a list, bullet list. Like a bulleted <laughs> list of words, perhaps like words in different languages. Um, <laughs> Anyway, he said it in all these languages. I guess the aliens did not speak English, Polish, Russian, or German. And so when he got nothing from them, he started stepping closer to the, uh, the craft and he tried to look through either the, the door or the, the windows in it. But as he got closer, the lights that were already so bright, they were so bright that he, that was hurting his eyes. And so luckily in his like, like go bag earlier he had welding goggles no he did not <laughs> this feels like renata found a ufo because like, <laughs> it feels like i and my purse ended up somewhere and said oh finally a use for this rubber duck <laughs> Me and my purse. okay Me and my purse and my social security card you know what like- the only the only time your purse has ever failed me was when i took you to let's make a deal and, I, like, know. I know and they have that that game in the middle where like you have they basically Wayne Brady calls out a bunch of <laughs> random items and whoever has them in like their was, purse yeah. wins. And it's like, rant, like you would never be able to prepare for it, but he knows that like people have weird shit in their bag at yes, all times. So smart. You should have won. It, it makes me so mad that the one time I needed you to have a bunch of crap in your bag. You, you know just- what? It's because you told me to wear a freaking costume. And so I had to wear this horrible slip outfit and guess who didn't wear a costume M. And so there was not even a chance we could win anything because M wasn't even in costume. So they put us in like the last row and they put Linda like way up front. So like, even if I had the deck of cards and 
blob set of jacks or whatever the hell he wanted you we could have redeemed have us i'm just saying I'm sorry. well that was a lot of pressure on me um i next do actually time, currently have time. a deck of cards in my bag and they're the krampus card uh playing cards because i went to my mom's recently so there are currently cards but i'm Question. a little late yeah because I, so I took you to let's make a deal. And then I had to go to work and my mm. mom had tickets to go back. And so you and Zandy went with yeah. my mom and my <laughs> stepdad to let's make a deal without me. Yeah. And so like, but you then knew what was coming. Did you not prepare your purse then? Um, that's, that's on you. My great friends. question. You know that's, what? That would be on me fully. That's the Christine problem right there. That's a me problem. You're completely okay. right. <laughs> It's only, it's only convenient when it's really inconvenient for everybody. I don't want it to be convenient for anybody. Then it defeats the purpose. Well, take a page out of the Falcon Lake incidents book and make sure you keep welding goggles in there from now on. I might, that's, it's not a terrible idea. If you're leaving, you never know, you never know. So, uh, he got closer to the UFO. It was super bright. And he was like, thank God I've got these goggles. He put them on, he looked in and he still only just saw lights. He said that he saw beams of light, flashes of light, sequences of light, but he didn't see anything else. Okay. Um, but he didn't get his retinas burned. So good for him. (laughs) Hey, oh, that's a win to me. Uh, so Steven then tried, he was like, okay, I can't see anything inside of this craft. I'm going to look on the exterior and just keep trying to study it the best I can. He said it was made of some sort of steel smooth all around. He said that it was quote, highly polished and looked like colored glass with light reflecting off of it. Ooh, like stained glass window. Kind of. Yeah. He, he, he also said, it formed a spectrum with a silver background as the sunlight hit the sides. So it was oh. just like, basically this entire thing was so wildly bright. He like, it even was like creating its own little background. Like Beautiful. everything else looked fuzzy. Eventually, as he's looking at it, the door closes as him like, I guess they were like, we actually don't want to make contact with you. Yeah. Sorry. This is getting weird. You have welding goggles on. It's a lot for us. To process. You're showing zero fear. We don't like that. <laughs> yeah. We're trying to intimidate you with our light show and it's not working. Right. Like we thought this would take your eyes out and you're still here. <laughs> we're trying to burn off your retinas. Yeah. And you're, you're causing problems. We didn't respond to you in four languages. Get it together. Like take the hint. <laughs> So uh, he ended up at one point touching the UFO just just to give it a shot. And he had been wearing gloves while he was doing this. They were like, I guess, like heavy leather gloves or something, I guess, for rock collecting. Oh, okay. Um, And so he went to go touch the UFO and immediately had to take his hand off because it was so hot (gasps) that it burned his gloves oh shit okay wow i'm glad he didn't i'm glad he had gloves on jeez can you imagine like oh my gosh um so finally the craft starts moving and it uh starts rotating in one direction and lifting at the same time oh fun it's like one of those like princess fairies that you pull and it spins away oh my favorite my favorite I thought those, I mean, you, you couldn't get better. I had one when I was a kid and I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. But then if it accidentally like bounced off something and hit you in the face, like it you hurt. were done for, oh, it, it hurt. was rough. Love those things. Uh, yes. Like a little fairy propeller. So yeah. I forget what they're called. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if we Googled little fairy propeller, we get it. <laughs> So, uh, the craft is rotating and lifting at the same time. And apparently it shoots out some sort of like, uh, the website said gas, but I don't know what, what type of liquid it was, but it was shooting out some sort of like propulsion fluid and it hit him in his yeah. shirt and his chest. And at the same time, I guess the machine itself was so hot that his shirt literally catches on fire. <gasps> what? So he I guess because like maybe the jet, the engine shot off or something. I don't know anything about cars, but something that happened. Right. <laughs> it was so hot or there was an explosion maybe after gas had sprayed on him that his whole shirt caught on fire. They need to get that checked out. I think this UFO so they, alien. They, oh, not the UFO, but Steven gets it checked well, out. Well, he also, yeah, for sure. So he, they didn't burn his retinas, but they did get him on fire. They didn't burn so, his entire body. Okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> it's rough. So he ripped off his shirt. He ripped off his like outer shirt and his bottom shirt, like freaking out. And by the time he like, like maintains like some semblance of sanity, he looks up and the UFO's gone. He says that it, um, he saw it maybe shoot out like 
30 feet or so. And by the time you look back up after his shirt, it was, it had vanished. So he tries to run to, uh, the place that the craft had been sitting to like get a better look at stuff. And he realizes that as soon as he gets close to it, he immediately feels sick. He's like (sighs) vomiting nonstop. Oh shit. And he says he has this like massive migraine. His vision was all fucked up. He had chest pains because he had literally just been on fire. Uh, he had cold sweats. Like it was, it was not good. It was no. not looking good. So uh, apparently they, uh, the longer he stayed, the more he got sick. And he said, quote, I knew that something totally unnatural had happened to me. Well, so yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. That's one way to put it. <laughs> so he tries leaving the woods, but his compass that he had was going fucking crazy. Oh, interesting. And eventually he stumbles out of the woods and he finds Constable Salaki. Okay. Um, and Salaki, there's, I feel like there were a couple of different versions to what happened here. Um, but Salaki ended up writing in his report that Steven looked like he was behaving drunk. He was like acting super confused and kind of freaked out and, and dazed and was puking and, and was puking. And he, to his credit, he never said this guy was drunk. He even said this guy didn't smell like he had been drinking, but for all intents and purposes, I, I could have not thought anything else except he was drunk. Sure. Like that's the closest semblance of what it could be. He was also saying things like, I just saw something in the woods and it attacked me and it burned me. And it was like, okay, but like, maybe you're drunk. Yeah. So, (laughs) uh, every time constable Salaki tried to approach him, this is kind of where it sounded like the stories differed between Salaki's report and Steven's report. But constable Salaki says when he tried to approach him, Steven would keep his distance. And, uh, when Salaki asked if he needed any medical help, uh, Steven said no. And so eventually Salaki literally left. He was like, he was like, I, I have other duties. I think that was I've his tried act- my best. <laughs> I think his actual quote was something along the lines of like, I'm sorry, but I have other duties. I have to like go do <laughs> like, if you're not going to help me help you, then I'm going to leave Fair. And so he just left. So what, uh, Steven's report is that he was keeping his distance whenever the constable tried to get near him. Cause he was like, what if I have radiation? What if I'm, what if something happened? I don't want to get you sick. Oh, so he, that was very thoughtful. Yeah. So he was like backing away cause he didn't want to hurt the other person or like get him sick. And, uh, I guess Salaki just took it the wrong way, but he, I guess Steven's version might've been that like, if he had been asked if he needed medical help, he would have said yes. Um, but anyway, he ended up wandering back uh, out of the woods, back to his hotel. He got a bus to Winnipeg and he was admitted to the hospital. Okay. So he, in the hospital was the misericordia. I don't know how to. Wow. <laughs> mis- mis- Miser What? Can you spell that? M-I-S-E-R. Miser. He, okay. There. I okay. that's French. I'm gonna text. I I'm gonna text it to you. Okay. It looks like misery, maybe. <laughs> I would think it's misere, like French. There you go. Oh, it's one word. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe I think it was misericordia. Misericordia. Okay. That looks. I do. I, I do like that. Almost the word misery is in a hospital's name. It does actually. Yeah. Um. Okay. So anyway, he got admitted to the hospital. So the nurses saw his burns and they later ended up saying that like, okay, the, the burns on his chest make sense because something like fire shot out on his shirt, that, sure. that tracks. But then <laughs> there was also burns on his stomach that were really fucking weird. So, um, they said, and you, I, at least from the unsolved mysteries reenactment, I'm guessing they worked off of his actual burns. So I, I was able to see the reenactment version of these burns, but they were dots in a very (gasps) precise grid, like a very, um, like a very exact grid. Like it didn't look like any of the dots were out of line or anything. It was like a perfect square grid of dots. Um, that was on his chest. It was on his stomach. Oh, stomach. Oh, also just a heads up. I Googled that word. Um, apparently it's Italian. Oh, and I hit pronunciation and it said misericordia. So Ooh. I don't think that's probably how you say it. Cause there's also one in Chicago apparently. So oh. I don't know how you would say it like in quote unquote English, but I wonder what it means fact. that two hospitals. Oh, it means mercy. 
up Mercy, like Mercy Hospital, which is the hospital Interesting here in that Cincinnati. Mercy and Misery look so similar. It's a, huh. a little questionable, huh? Um, so yeah, so these dots are in this That's like weird, very creepy square grid on his pat on his stomach. And what's even weirder is this this dot grid looks perfectly like the pattern on the UFO that can be <gasps> proven later because Stephen had already sketched everything. <gasps> That's weird. It looks exactly like, like even down to like the rows and the columns and the number of dots there are. It's that's really freaky. So his son, Stan, who at the time was nine or 10, he actually remembers visiting his dad in the hospital and also confirming what Salaki said. They're like, oh yeah, my dad was not acting like himself. He was rough he was like acting real dazed and confused apparently he reeked of sulfur and ozone and it wasn't just the- so interesting that steven said oh this machine smells like yeah. sulfur and ozone and now all of a sudden he smells like it maybe because he got sprayed with that stuff i don't know yeah. but uh his son stan says that he smelled like that for weeks after <gasps> even after showers it was like it was oh, a that's part- terrible he said something like it was almost like it was a part of him. It was, Ew. that was really creepy. Uh, Stan also remembers his dad being sick for weeks and being really achy and like losing a lot of weight. He was super tired all the time. And uh, the burns later, I guess they were still looking at these burns uh, after he had already gone home, but he was going back in for checkups. And it was determined after testing that these were not radiation burns, which is Oh, good yeah because the thing uh every other sign was like with his behavior and how sick he was getting it was all pointing to radiation poisoning <gasps> oh, okay and so they were like okay maybe these are like burns from radiation or something they found out that these are not uh radiation based but they were chemical burns yeah even so it was chemical burns but with behavioral side effects of what seemed like radiation poisoning how strange <clears throat> so Stephen for a while refused to talk about the UFO or what happened, but eventually he decided that he wanted to protect other people in case someone else saw this or to prevent it. So he ends up going to the Winnipeg Tribune. The article that he uh, got interviewed for was called I Was Burned by a UFO. And the article <laughs> this is pretty straightforward. Yeah. They were like, we're not fucking around here with this. <laughs> like, just know what happened from the start. <laughs> Um, it's not clickbait, you know, it's like just what it is. It's actually the truth. Yeah. So the article spread like wildfire and this is when the media started questioning him all the time. And it was apparently later on, he said, super overwhelming. Um, at the same time, he also reaches out to the cops to see if he can like make a report. And eventually it's taken so seriously that it is now being looked into by the military, both the U S and, uh, Canadian forces. The Polish. No. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> the Russians stopped by. <laughs> so the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, aka the Mounties. Yay. Oh, a dream. I have a pen that looks like a Mountie. Makes me really? very happy. It's How carved cute. out of wood. Oh my gosh. Um, That's fancy. I got it in the airport when you ditched me and Eva there for three hours. Okay, Do you remember listen. that? <laughs> no. <laughs> remember when you abandoned us in another country? I no? didn't abandon you. I dropped you off at your favorite amusement park. Okay. <laughs> The okay. Vancouver airport. <laughs> I will say Eva and I really bonded. Like that was, I know you did. That You're was welcome, by the way, <laughs> like the Canadian, what airport was it? Vancouver, Vancouver, that airport, which by the way, of all airports to get stuck in, that one was <laughs> literally a mall. Like there was yeah. every single spot. There was like a huge sort of shop through and it was all chunky. The worst is that it's fully my fault. Cause we showed up way too late. Cause I'm always like, I have like a very tight window of like, this is when we get to the airport. We showed up and I, I forgot it was an inner, cause it was like a two hour flight and I forgot it was an international flight. And they were like, we <laughs> literally can't take your suitcases. Um, oopsies. I'm it was sorry. a good look. I look, I bought. So it was the amount of money that I walked into the Vancouver airport with and left <laughs> with are very different numbers. Okay. Also, I made a whole apology page in the scrapbook I gave you of just like a three page spread of like, this is me abandoning you. And I'm sorry. I'll never, I'll never live up to, to my hey, apology. It was, I had a good time. Anyway, <laughs> the Mounties, here we go. So the RCMP or the Mounties, they wanted to look into the craft's landing site. And Steven actually gave them his own sketches to be like, 
go fucking crazy. <laughs> and uh, there's also, I saw an Unsolved Mysteries that Steven actually also went back to the site a few times himself. Um, and they were able to find personal items of his still at the scene, including his scorched shirt and glove that he had ripped off oh, because they yeah. were on fire. Um, they were able to see basically, they very, it's like they were very strategically trying to not say crop circle, but they kept saying like a wide round diameter of oh dead vegetation. God. Like it was like, okay. In a cornfield. Like, <laughs> it was literally in a field. I was like, so is this a crop circle? I'm yes. So anyway, that's what they also found that. Um, and Stan, his son says that there were two sketches that Stephen gave the Mounties. He said that there was an overhead view and there was a sectional view so you could see the changes in elevation, end quote. Whoa. And he also said uh, that was like pretty typical for his dad. <laughs> he was like, that just is sure, who he it is. It is a very dad move, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So then he says he even put in a compass reference on his notes showing <laughs> where compass north, magnetic north was uh, right on the piece of paper. And he handed it to them. He said, this is all I remember. They went out there with this thing in their hand and a regular map, a topographic map. Uh, they couldn't find the spot, but when they actually did find it, every single thing matched up. So <sighs> it was like, he told the story, gave everything he had to the police and they were able to completely confirm like whatever wow. he, they couldn't confirm that there was a UFO there, but they confirmed all the remnants of like something yeah. weird happened here. So again, the personal items they found were um, his scorched shirt and his glove. And apparently he had left some pieces of his kit there. And very quickly, the Air Force, the Canadian Army, researchers from different universities, doctors, uh, <gasps> the Atomic Energy Department of Canada, uh, air, and then in America, they have the, or in a, the US, they have the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, or APRO. <laughs> All of them got involved with this case Jeez. and investigators, like I said, also were able to confirm that there was at least a crop circle or dead vegetation diameter uh, around Stephen's story. Meanwhile, as they're investigating every three months, and I think this was like for the rest of time, every three months, Stephen's burns flare up. No, no like their brand new wounds and no. he gets sick all over again where what he's a nightmare. like vomiting. I don't know if it was every three months in the beginning and then it slowly kind of faded into not as often, but it sounded from the notes like Steven had to deal with this for the rest of his That's life. Terrible. Um, a, one of the people in the unsolved mysteries who had spoken with Steven said there have been times where like, he'll let you even like touch through his shirt and you can feel like the subcutaneous <gasps> scarring of his of the dot pattern which he calls his buttons ew <laughs> like, oh dad so why that's such a dad thing of why like let me give weird? let me give this really already odd thing a really odd name <laughs> but let i think guess when you touch it he goes beep Beep, beep, boop, boop. Okay, but if he does, that's precious. Are you I kidding know, me? It's like, very adorable. Boop, 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 boop. Um, anyway, also, like, I would probably be that person too to like make light of like a really oh, absolutely. Situation. Operator, like, yeah, no, I'm, exactly. I'm just examining your burns, sir. You're in the hospital. Or like, I would make someone press the button and be like, you pressed the wrong one. You got to keep going. Like, something stupid. Wrong number. Yeah. So anyway, he calls them his buttons, and you can like for sure still feel the scarring <gasps> there. A year after the event, when Stephen went back to the site, he was able to still, a year later, dig up radioactive molten rock from the ground. <gasps> so the so the items that they had found in previous investigations on uh, on the land had been sent to analysis labs, and they could not be explained even after going through all this analysis. But they were highly radioactive, and that includes the soil and parts of the rock that the UFO apparently landed on. I guess they had like literally chipped into this rock and they were able to find fragments of metal that had been melted into the rock. Whoa. As if like the UFO was so hot that it was melting the like the earth's rock. Oh, Jesus. And so they were able to test those and they were radioactive. So anyway, he came back a year later and they were still finding things in the ground that were radioactive. That's freaky, okay. So a lot of people though use this as a point of debate of like how come after all these like nonstop investigations for a year nobody found that like kept how come there was still pieces left and no one like dug everything up, um so that ends up that ends up being like an argument that this is all a hoax that like maybe things were still being planted a year later oh I see I see I see 
So anyway. Or maybe it was just such expansive radiation, okay, that they couldn't find them all. Bingo. Just saying. I, I don't know. I also just want to believe that it's all real a thousand percent. So well, yeah. But apparently, uh, yeah, they were still, there was one item that looked like a, a weird, like metal welded shape. It like ended up being in like the shape of a W. So it was weird that like the metal had bent in a certain <laughs> way. Or like it wouldn't have bent that way when sitting on the rock. So it must have come bent, but then why would they need it? So then it became all these like theories of like why this piece of metal even existed, I see. why it was, why it was radioactive. Why didn't anyone find it for a year when it was like a big enough piece that a metal sure. detector would have gotten it. Apparently that when they did test it, one of the weird things about this piece of metal was that it was nearly a hundred percent pure silver. Oh. Um, and there was something sticky on it, which they found out was like uh, some sort of pitch blend ore, which had combinations of radium and uranium in it. Um, I was like, so, we're going maple syrup route, but I like the ore too. <laughs> I'll, t- I'll take it. Look, I'm down with like, if it had maple syrup on it, I would want to take it Can home you for myself. You're like out on like a gem hunt and you find like a piece of silver covered in syrup. Uh, I can say, well, this has almost nothing to do with it, but my mind immediately went to when I lived in Boston, I went on like a maple tree tapping excursion and I thought I, it was a blast. Uh, this has nothing to do with aliens at this point, but you said maple syrup enough times that I now feel like I got permission to talk about it. Yeah. I, I, uh, I opened the the floodgates for lack of a better word. Anyway, if no one's done that before, it was insane. And also it was one of the first times I ever did anything alone by myself. Oh. Like it was like a, like a me date. And I was like, wow, I'm so fun to be with. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> and then you never hung out with anyone ever again. Cause you and found then- your best friend and it was yourself. <laughs> Got it. And then I brought home some maple syrup that I tapped by myself. No, that's so, pretty cool. It was pretty swanky. I so, love that. um, la, 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 la. or we? plutonium oh. or something. That's back to the future, but yes. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it had, it had radium and uranium in it on top of already being radioactive. And it was nearly hundred percent silver. It was just very weird. And that why did weird. it take a year for anyone to find it? Let alone the person who is like the uh, near abductee, like why is yeah. he finding it and not the military? Oh, he so found it. He found yeah, it when he went out with, odd, I guess, <clears throat> but so we don't know what happened. Maybe it was just like something that's undetectable by our machines. And because he has a connection with the UFO, they brought him to it. I mean, it could be anything. So maybe it was too far away. Nobody I mean, who knows people miss stuff. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? So apparently, uh, like I said, Steven dealt with random flare ups and also random blackouts after this. Mm. I I'm guessing for the rest of the time, because there didn't seem to be a, a time limit on that. Um, he ended up dying in 1999 he often regrets telling his story because the media and general criticism was so incessant. And it says that it like just completely like quote flipped their lives. That always makes down. me sad. Yeah. I, I think he was just like, people were telling him that they didn't believe him. They were Life questioning his sanity. Beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I saw in one reference that like the sun stand like got bullied for it. Oh, <clears throat> so anyway, but he he's Stan. Life's hard enough for a nine-year-old <laughs> named Stan, I would imagine. Yeah. What is a South Park? So huh. he did say that he uh, he originally at the very beginning totally stuck by like I need to tell people because it could protect them in case something like this happens to them. And Stephen, Stan, and this guy I have not mentioned at all yet, but his name is Chris Ratowski who is one of Stan's childhood friends, but he ended up growing up to be like Canada's like primo UFO expert. <gasps> wow. So like, I think maybe like this story with mm-hmm. Steven, like he watched his own friend's dad go through this. So maybe that's what like jogged his fascination, cool. but he ends up becoming like the guy for UFOs in Canada. So uh, Steven, Stan and Chris, um, they all agreed to go on Unsolved Mysteries uh, in the nineties, uh, because they were hoping to find other witnesses to corroborate the case. So that was, they were thinking like, maybe they would get to meet other people that they were being interviewed. Um, but they never found anybody else to corroborate, uh, the story as accurately as they wanted, but they did say out of all the outlets to cover the case, unsolved mysteries is hands down the best coverage of the story. 
Um, Stan actually is quoted saying they did a very credible job of recreating the incident. They interviewed my dad, me, Chris, and they did a balanced story that had nothing but facts, very little speculation. And it turned out to be the best piece. This was in 1992 when it first aired. So you can see how many years had passed from 1967 before we had a decent, well-treated, well-written story. Love that. Love that. And also like, yeah, that does make it pretty obvious of like from 67 to 92 it took that long for someone to like really flush out like what the story was about. yeah and like do it justice wow so if you want to go watch that it's season five episode eight i do and it was really quick there they were super quick stories um there are two books that have been written about this uh one is george dudding's the falcon lake ufo encounter And another that was co-written by Chris Rutowski and Stan. Mm. Um, So I think this came out in 2017. And at this point, Stephen has uh, not been with us for like almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. So they wrote it themselves in honor of him. It was called When They Appeared, Falcon Lake 1967, The Inside Story of a Close Encounter. (gasps) When they appeared. And they wrote it for the incident's 50th anniversary cool so um there's also apparently steven also wrote his own like 40 page manuscripts and it's called my encounter with the ufo um he wrote that i i think the same year that everything happened to him but so i said chris and stan they wrote their book for the 50th anniversary also for the 50th anniversary canada came out with a glow-in-the-dark collectible coin with a no. ufo on it it cost twenty dollars at the time. There's only about four thousand in circulation, and it currently is worth up to fifteen hundred dollars. What? So that fun is fact. so cool. So there's only four thousand. If you happen to be someone who has stumbled upon this in your closet or something, hold on to that. Yeah, seriously. Um, Chris himself, who again, I'm like he has been on. He has written a bunch of books. He's like a the UFOologist of Canada. He says, we won't, he won't say for sure whether or not it's a UFO, but quote, if it was a hoax then it would be a hoax to rival some of the greatest hoaxes ever perpetrated anywhere. Um, (laughs) Stan Stan calls the Falcon Lake incident, quote, probably the most documented and investigated UFO case in North America. And to back that, Chris even says that it's a bigger case than Roswell, which is interesting that I found this story right after I just covered Roswell. Yes, you did. So it's fresh in everyone's mind that there was in 20 years before this encounter in 1947, there was a crash. The military like scooped it all up and tried to cover it up. Um, But this is what Chris says about how it's bigger than the Roswell case. And this is a very long quote, but this is the last thing I'm going to say. Um, and again, I got this from the transcript from that podcast, uh, UFOs at LAC or UFOs at LAC. So shout out to them. Uh, okay. It's bigger than the Roswell case. Chris says, quote, here we have an incident where not only was a witness physically injured and the injuries were examined by medical doctors, but upon investigation, the case discovered physical evidence in the form of soil uh, and the site itself had been located. The radiation at the site was verified. And then later, certainly after the fact, the unusual silver pieces that are also radioactive were discovered. We have physical evidence in terms of metals and soil. We have physiological evidence in terms of what happened to Mr. Mikulak. Uh, it's a very strange case because we have so much documented evidence. There's been many pages on the case that are physically kept in the national archives from the RCMP and the RCAF, but also we have the United States Air Force's Colorado investigation files, in addition to civilian research files, plus correspondence between physicians in the United States and Canada uh, on Mr. Mikulak. We have the Mayo Clinic files because Mr. Mikulak Mm. went down to the Mayo Clinic to be tested for a better understanding of what had befallen him. That's cool. Plus many other documents that are incidental. Overall, we have huge amounts of documents, which the Roswell case certainly doesn't have. In fact, the United States government denies anything happened, but the Canadian Mm. government verifies that something very (gasps) unusual happened to Stephen Mikulak. Leave it to Canada. The Canadian government. Well, leave it to Canada because I found out during this that Canada like has basically all of their UFO files as public access, like (gasps) all any documentation. They even said like, yeah, Canada's much better than the U.S. at this. Like after like like the U.S. tries to keep everything so quiet, but if there's like UFO files and like government documents about UFO files, Canada just has like all this free access. So fun fact. Fun fact, another reason why I love Canada, and that's the story of the Falcon Lake incident. Wow. That's pretty, pretty dope. That's yeah. pretty dope. I love that this one didn't have a lot of like 
reasoning why it would be fake. You know what I mean? I feel like a lot of times we get like a full, like, here's the backstory on why he could be making it all up, but there wasn't much there today. So this, I mean, to this day, it's still considered an unsolved mystery, but so they, they like the government has said it's unexplained, but they at least admit that like, yo, something weirds up. Like, yeah, yeah, that's huge. I love that. Anyway. Um, very good job. (laughs) Ta-da. How was your pee? Did you have a good pee? It was excellent. I'm so glad you asked. Thank you so much. You'll be receiving my postcard in the mail pretty soon. Kind of upset we didn't FaceTime while you made peeps, but that's okay. You know, we did, but like from the other room, like here on Zoom. Oh, oh, I see. I see. I see. I see. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. yeah. I'm picking up what you're throwing down. I already had you on call. So. Oh. <laughs> all right. Tell me a tale. Bum me the fuck out. Let's go. This is a good one. Um, They're all good ones if I do say so myself, but this one is about the killing dentist. <gasps> Oh, wait a minute. I love this. Okay. But I, you know what I mean? Like, I don't love that it happened, yes. but compared to, you know, it's what I, I mean when like... I say it's a good one. It's not a good uh-huh. one. Like it's yeah, not yeah, a yeah, good yeah. thing that it happened obviously, but it's, it's just good... like, it's still bad, but like a tale. I'm not going to like be wildly depressed by the end. Like I was with some of the more graphic ones maybe. Yeah. 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 It's like kind of an older story, which always helps to kind of separate uh-huh. it's, it's really fucked up don't get me wrong um but maybe less um in your face than usual uh-huh. so gotcha. we'll, we'll see we'll see you you can be the judge I don't know sure um, I'm so jaded at this point by these stories they don't really face me as much as they used to you think um, I would be jaded but every time I'm just like know. wow what on earth did I walk myself into I guess four years I was ago? always jaded because from day one I was telling <laughs> these stories that like I was really fascinated by so I don't think I ever I don't know. I've always, it's always been the same level of shock and awe. I mean, look, I'm always, I'm jaded at this point to like, every time I see that there's a woman in red or some bullshit, I'm like, (laughs) I I gotta talk about this again. Oh my God. Oh my God. She needs so much attention. This woman in red. (laughs) What if the like plot twist, it's actually the same woman in red at every single location. Like maybe she just needs a ton of validation. And I mean, we're giving it to her. And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. We get it. That's her prerogative. We you know? show up everywhere wearing the same clothes usually. So like it's black shirt, yeah. no pants. I mean logo shirt I got for free of our podcast. Yeah, pretty <laughs> standard. No pants, exactly. What if the ghost with no pants? That's gonna be like the 21st century ghost, like the, the quarantine ghost. We're still waiting on that one because I haven't died yet. But afterwards, like everyone's gonna be seeing the pantsless ghost, don't you? Worry. Pantsless ghost, 100 percent And every time you'll be scared because I'm a I'm a ghost, but also I'll be scared because I'll like cover myself and be like, oh my god, I'm not wearing pants not and again. Then, and then we're both scared and it becomes a thing. So it's like a scooby-doo, like ah, ah. Love you got it. it. You got it. Well, here you go. Uh, this is the killing dentist, and um, there's apparently a horror film called the dentist as if I've ever seen it, <laughs> not going to happen. Um, <laughs> I don't have plans to have you, I haven't seen the dentist, but I will say, and I just mentioned this with the tooth fairy, that there's a scary movie called darkness falls and it's about the tooth fairy. Yeah, and that weird. was a classic in my house growing up. And then also not a dentist, but a different medical profession. There's my favorite cheesy eighties a uh, horror movie that like a horror movie that's so bad that you can only watch it to laugh at is Dr. Giggles. That's What's a good that? one. It's literally <laughs> like the dumbest thing I've ever seen. So sorry if you were a part of making Dr. Giggles, but you knew what you were doing when you, when you, you got knew, on that You set. know what you've done. It's literally a guy who it's a crazed guy who pretends he's a doctor and he breaks into your house. And the whole time he's killing you, he's like giggling and says, uh... but it's like, it's, like I think it's meant to be like a really bad Over horror movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like no one's taking it seriously. No one's going into this movie being like, I'm gonna be scared. I'm gonna know? watch it and be horrified and call you crying. So we we could up. definitely watch Dr. Giggles together and you would be fine. Let's put it really on. okay. Cause you made me watch that one horrible movie. What was that? Okay. That was the exact opposite. That scared end. me so much. What was that, that- called? <laughs> yeah, sinister. I that That's, is not good for me. That one is like why would you do that to me? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. (laughs) Well, fun fact. Uh, if you have a fear of the dentist, it's pretty damn common. It's called dentophobia, Hmm. uh, or odontophobia sometimes. Um, and according to WebMD, dental phobia is a more serious 
condition than anxiety or more common than anxiety, huh. uh, more widespread than anxiety. Sounds so. like a type of anxiety. <laughs> it like- sounds certainly does to me. Yeah. I would agree. I, I, I would argue maybe they're hand in hand, but I guess not. If some people don't have anxiety, but have a fear of the dentist, I don't know. Blows my mind. I feel like they're just so meant to be. Yeah. You know? They're, they're holding hands in my mind, but star crossed lovers. Okay. Oh, well. So this is the story of Glennon Edward Engelman. He is known as the killing dentist. He was born in 1927 and was raised in St. Louis by a middle-class family. His father was originally a U.S. Air Force member, but now worked on the railroad and his mother worked at home raising Glennon and his three older siblings. He was the youngest. Uh, Known to be an average student at school, he was pretty unremarkable for lack of a better term. Nobody Yikes. thought he was, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Nobody thought he was like unusual or acted strange or had any sort of like compulsions or act- actions that were out of the ordinary. Um, and once he finished high school, he served in the U S army air Corps during world war II. Um, and according to uh, one source called rander.com, he joins Timothy McVeigh, Jeffrey Dahmer, son of Sam, a.k.a. David Berkowitz, and Green River Killer, a.k.a. Gary Ridgway, as some of the famous murderers who Whoa. served in the U.S. military. So, fun fact. That is a fun a fact. It's not like a, it's not a happy fact, but, but it's a fun fact. Yeah, yeah. It's, in our, it's our version of a fun fact. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> so, when returning after service, Engelman spent his time giving back to the neighborhood. He helped treat and look after ill people in the community because... Out of the kindness of his heart, he wanted to care for those who needed the help and needed the medical service. Um, And the community really thought, like, this is a good guy. He Say less. We get it. He's he's a a pillar of uh the community. uh From pillar to killer. (laughs) He's a pillar. He's a pillar. We know how this goes. (laughs) Um, So with the help of the GI Bill, he was able to enroll at Washington University of St. Louis School of Dentistry um, and start his career as a dentist. Um, I I assume most of us in the U.S. know about the GI Bill. I don't know if that's a common thing or if that was just something I learned in like AP U.S. history. I feel Uh, like that's a common thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think so, at least in the U.S. But if you're not in the U.S. or you don't totally know, um, it's basically a post-World War II uh, kind of government adjustment uh, from 1944 that helped service people um, gain access to college education um, and other options, benefits like that. And that was mostly tuition free, which I did not know this. As a result, almost 49% of college admissions in 1947 were veterans. Almost 50%. I'm not surprised by that. Or, My- yeah, 49%. My grandpa, he did that. I think both of them did that. They went to college with the GI Bill afterwards. They were like, oh, well, yeah. I got this check after I mean- <laughs> all my hard work. I might as well go to college because I got I got to find another way to support do? my family. Exactly, so. exactly. So that's kind of what happened here. Engelman went to dentistry school. Um, and around this time at college, he met Edna Ruth Ball. And uh, they fell in love, got married in 1953 in Clayton, Missouri. Engelman was 26. Edna was 19. Um, they, in two years, not only did Engelman graduate from Washington university, he also divorced Edna for unknown reasons, but they were still amicable. Um, and then he married a woman named Ida G van Hest on April 20th, 1956. And at this point he was 29, she was 25. So Ida, so Edna is the first wife and then um, Ida and Ida is the second wife. So that's, it's EDA. So it's spelled the same without an N. The N. Huh? Yep. Okay. So from Edna to Ida. Uh, these are his two wives so far, so far. And uh, between him graduating and his first known murder, it is reported by the richest.com that Engelman first attempted to satiate his thirst for taking innocent lives by killing animals. <gasps> well, I can't say I'm surprised, but I, I don't like it anyway. But you know what is weird is it it wasn't until he was an adult. I feel like a lot of times we hear yeah. about this as a child, like antisocial, like tendencies that's a great point that usually it's like one of the first signs when the kid doesn't even really know what they're doing yet or right you know, doesn't know what they're doing yet you know yeah 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 exactly so I, I will say to be fair um apparently he was obsessed with hunting and so he would go hunting and um his friends and family were like he was like really into hunting um and he would keep parts of the animals as like his trophies i mean to be fair i'm i to to be clear, I'm not into hunting for obvious reasons, No, but why? I know it's surprising to a lot of you, um, with all my gun collection, as you can see behind me, uh, <laughs> Squidward, <laughs> my crocheted Squidward. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, you do have but, a bunch of animals behind you, though, on that wallpaper that could maybe get hunted by someone like him. That's right. Some trophy hunting, a little yeah. lion here, cheetah there. Yikes. Um, but like, as much as I'm not a fan of hunting, I do recognize in my mind that there's a difference between going hunting for sport and going hunting to murder animals. Like, this is fun for me to kill them. Like, I feel like right. there's a difference there. There's, um, there's a line that maybe some people consider a gray space, but I would yeah. say there still is the line. Agreed. Agreed. So that's kind of where I stand. Cause I was like, Oh God, hurting animals. And then it was like, he went hunting and I was like, well, a lot of people go hunting, but I guess the difference is that he went hunting in order to hurt the animals, which is like, yikes. He, uh, like he went in with an enjoyment of the pain that will, yeah. and the suffering that will come from hurting the animal. Precisely. Shooting. At least according to his friends and family, which seems like a little bit. No, 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 no. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm not, not super on board with that. Uh, cause I feel like if you say to someone, oh, I don't like hunting cause you're killing animals. They're not like, well, it's not about killing. Like, I feel like they're not like, yeah, they, so they come fun. Up with, <laughs> or they'll at least say like, oh, we try to do it as humanely yeah. as, as humanely as you can by hunting an animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, right. Okay. Like, but yeah, time. they're like, we're, we're trying to like shoot it in the head once. Right. So it's it not like, because pain. we want to watch it die. Like it, I feel like right, that's usually right. not the angle people go with. So yeah. I can understand the difference here, basically. Um, and then uh, it wasn't long before he graduated from animals to people anyway. So like we were bound to get there. Yeah. Uh, he got a taste for human murder on December 17th, 1958. He was now 31 and he shot. Okay. So <laughs> he shot someone. Do you remember Edna, his first wife? <gasps> her? No, he shot her new husband. <gasps> I thought they were amicable. Like they that were that's problematic there's i mean it's that's really awful but also like that makes me think there was some more underlying drama there than we were well i'll tell on. you <gasps> you want to know the backstory the drums yes obviously i have some some tea for you it's, i know it's tea time oh. wednesday but i'll give you some tea here that's okay um so her husband james bullock was a clerk for the union electric company of missouri and was a part-time student and he was shot near the St. Louis Art Museum with a 22 caliber gun on his way to attend a night class. Oh. I know. And um, Edna and James Stanley Bullock had only been married for five and a half months when he was murdered. So it was a very new marriage. However, it wasn't, as you probably imagine, as we both imagined, the case of a jealous ex-husband. In fact, Edna had given Engelman consent to kill James in what? order for them to collect on his life insurance. Oh, together. so they were amicable, amicable. They were amicable for a farther extent than we thought. <laughs> wow. I, for a second, I was like, oh, they weren't as friendly as you said. And now they're like so exactly. friendly. It like wow. turns it on its head. It's like, oh, they were really friendly, like too friendly. One might say. Wow. Can you imagine getting along that well with your ex? <laughs> yeah, no, please. No, Holy I barely crap. have a conversing relationship, let alone like let's plot murders have, of our loved ones together. I couldn't even, couldn't even imagine. Huh. No. So, uh, hmm. I, I know that saying she gave him consent to kill him is quite a weird way to use the word consent. It's not quite a phrase. Yeah. It's, it's not quite phrase. what I mean. Consent. But she was like down with it. Like yeah, she, she was, was on board. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. She wasn't saying no, she wasn't making sure it wouldn't happen. She was on the wrong side of history. Yeah, precisely. Great way to put it. <laughs> so Edna collected 64,000 from James's life insurance, which today would be $600,000, so more than that, um, over $600,000, so a lot. Uh, at the time, Engelman wasn't considered a suspect for two reasons. First, he allegedly had an alibi. And second, according to the podcast Medical Murders, which is a great podcast show, uh, quote, the St. Louis police had been thrown off by the fact that the alley where James was murdered was a known meeting spot for gay men. So they assumed Ooh. Bullock had been having an affair and was murdered by his lover or an angry bigot. Oh, This theory dominated the investigation, bringing detectives to a dead end rather quickly, which was lucky for Engelman because he didn't even get eyed as a suspect. Wow. Which is like... A <laughs> It's another issue of like it, people see like, oh, uh, a relationship and some sort of a LGBT relationship. It must have been a spurned lover. It's like, OK, mm -hmm. uh, you're just painting yourself into a corner and it's not it has nothing to even do with that. Ultimately, <laughs> right. But whatever. Good so, guess. But good guess. <laughs> good try, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's just at the art museum on his way to a class. But OK, I know. Um, 
So Edna handed Engelman $16,000 of the life insurance payment. Uh, and then he decided to use that money to create a drag racing drag strip business, not oh. the like fun, cool kind that we know of. Today. I was like, that sounds pretty gay. <laughs> yeah. Like, not the play on words, fun kind, but like the kind my stepdad likes the like Yikes. drag racing, you know, cars, whatever. Yeah, I don't yeah, really yeah. get it. But so he decided to create this drag st- strip slash drag racing business. Um, and he put the $16,000 toward that. And he was like set for a while because he had his drag racing business. He had dentistry. He was married to Ida um, and his murder, his next murder didn't happen for five years. So he seemed content for a while. So he like up until that point, I don't know if you know this information. I feel like if you did, you would have already said it. But so for the five years in between his first and second kill, do you think he was like, satiated by it like you think like those five years he like wasn't thinking about killing anyone and he had like gotten it out of his system or had he been plotting for five years um I don't think he was plotting because when he gets to the next murder it's it seems very much like I feel like every murder like to correct me if I'm wrong when you hear it but it feels like every murder he kind of plans on the fly or like it doesn't seem like the most well thought out winded like five-year plan I guess Um, it also feels at least the the first murder it feels like there was like a monetary reward or like something that came from it to make it worth it so and ultimately he does say it was for money and that's debated and I'll tell you why later but he does his quote-unquote excuse ultimately is I did it for financial reasons I did all my murders for financial reasons which is like okay I guess uh not okay I'm saying like which is which is like hmm you can argue that but I I don't believe you I don't totally believe you that seems like a little bit ridiculous um based on some of these stories but yeah so I I don't know if he was content or maybe you know how sometimes with these serial killers it's just like the the time between gets shorter and shorter and shorter like maybe it was just one of those where he was like wow I killed someone because it was his first murder and then like as that wore off, mm-hmm. finally yeah. got into another and it kind of got shorter intervals. Maybe that's what it was. Um, so I'm not totally sure, but it was okay. five years of general peace in his household. Okay. So for what it's worth. Sure. Um, so on September 26th, 1963. All right. I'm sorry. I have to say this now. I told myself I would say it the next time I said the, the month of, can you say that? What's the month after August? September. Can you say it again? no why because I can't say it right you say it September with a z what in the German is that what is that what I do everybody like not everybody but a few people over the years of the podcast have said like I love the way Christine says September and I'm like what do I say weird about it oh because you say it with a z you go like like you're like September Z- September <laughs> it's September okay well this is where I admit that I'm dreading if my baby's born in September because I don't know how to say it so I'm gonna have to like learn the proper pronunciation and I feel like I've been trying to tweak it as I go to be fair I never noticed it until this moment when you're telling really okay but uh, but also like I am so comfortable in drawls and like and like combining words and so if you're saying you know a word that ended in s and then goes into september yeah it, it could very easily just be like excuse as like oh it was just kind of connecting the words wow but, see it just never occurred but to now me. that you're saying it by itself it is odd it's been something <laughs> i'm so weirdly self-conscious about for like a couple years now because people tend to i'm not meanly but they're like oh it's so funny how how cute christine says it in such a german way and i'm like what do i say but then i realized like because in german it is september so it's like September. Oh, I'm clearly right. saying it like the German. Can take way. the girl out of Germany. Well, <laughs> oh my God. well there You're you have lucky it. I don't say all the other ones German. That would be quite uh, an adventure for us. The, my favorite word that you ever say could be is Stroll Peter, and I'll I'll never know. How- <laughs> it makes me so happy because it's it's something in the language where my mouth never learned how to make that sound, and so I'm just jealous you can pronounce it that way, and I can't get it. <laughs> how do you say it? Peter? yeah yeah what is that <laughs> Strube, sound? Strube. it's the r the Strube. listen Strube. 
I don't want to embarrass the Germans. I don't want to embarrass myself. I don't need to say it out loud. Yeah, the but... Germans are so embarrassed. Okay, they don't get well, embarrassed. They're, they're definitely going to get cringe. <laughs> it's definitely cringy when, if I keep going and like, I know I'm only going to fail. But that sound I'll, is just like beyond a capability for me. I love I'm how I am like just uh, bitching about myself and you like to build me back up. I, that makes me very happy. No, you look, you make some weird sounds, but you also make some sounds <laughs> I can't make. So I, <laughs> I guess that it's a win. So to be clear, it's September. This is sure. so embarrassing. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, have you not ever seen it written out? Like it's definitely yeah, September. With a, well, okay. <laughs> like you're, you're, you're acting mind blown that it sounds I like am, there's an S up the front. I can't, it just, I don't know. I'm like 30. I don't know. It just never really hit me until recently. And then when people ask like, oh, when's the baby going to be born? I keep saying like, oh, either because it's October 1st is the due date. So I'm like, oh, either in October or September. And like, I just, the more I say it, the more I'm like, people do it's tend to comment. It definitely sounds like you're saying the first half of zipper, like September. September. Zipper, zip recruiter, <laughs> September. Okay. It's actually, it's, it's sep recruiter. Do you mind? Sep okay. recruiter. <laughs> Maybe that'll help your issue of saying zip recruiter by accident. Okay. That's still the most embarrassing thing. <laughs> okay. So I'll practice it just in case. Cause if the baby is born in September, then I'm going to have to like learn how to say the month, I think properly. Yep poor kid is just at such a disadvantage in so many ways. <laughs> yeah. It's such a disadvantage that they can be raised bilingual. It really sucks for them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh. On September 26, 1963, the same year that Engelman's drag strip opened, um, mm-hmm. he struck again. So maybe this is his celebration moment. He either murdered, depending on the source, his business partner or his employee, but somebody who worked oh. with him. Okay. So, uh, Eric Fry, who was a guy involved in the drag strip business was struck on the head with a rock pushed <gasps> down a well, and then blown up with dynamite. Holy fuck. Okay. <laughs> like literally Acme cartoon level like, shit. Meet me like, like, like anvil. Yeah. Like an Acme anvil. Okay. So wait, a well. rock on the head fell into a well blown up with dynamite. Yeah. Correct. That literally is a, like a Hannah. I was going to say Hannah Barbera, Hannah. I say what's... Barbera, but again, I say September. So who the fuck knows what it is? It literally sounds like something that you would see like in the Flintstones. I can't 100%. Believe... I mean, like also not to discredit the fact that somebody literally was murdered, but like, I no, I like, I think about how I'm going to die one day, but, uh, and I have like some guesses on like how I'm going to go. That's not one of them. Like, yeah, you wouldn't think, huh? Like you wouldn't plan for that. At least uh, most people. Um, and so I'm sure he didn't, but get, get ready. His death was ruled as accidental. By what? Why? Because <laughs> animators drew it or something? Because like- <laughs> it was a cartoon and he survived. No, <laughs> I don't know because here's the, that like, makes little, no sense. It makes no sense. And I have a little timeline here. Um, this was compiled by Jessica Silver, Jen Varley, and Kirby Wellsco for Radford University. Oh, um, what up? I know. I thought that had a connection to you somehow. Yes. <laughs> um, Eric Fry's wife, Sandy, who was a friend of Engelman's, donated the life insurance money to Engelman's drag strip. So we have another pattern here where the Uh wife is like, oh, no, my husband, Eric Fry, died accidentally by getting pushed into a well filled with dynamite. Oops. Here's the money, Mr. Engelman, who owns the drag strip where Eric worked. So uh, what the hell, right? Well, it turns out that Sandy isn't just Engelman's friend. Uh, She is Engelman's wife Eda's niece oh and lover and his lover <gasps> oh okay so I was right okay. <laughs> you were right but wow. it's also his niece in law so it's his niece in law and his lover so like yuck um so he's like just doing favors for all these women that he's ha- hooked up with at some point in time. well it's not even favors because it ultimately is <laughs> his, his money idea. And, or yeah. he and he's also getting money out he's of it he's profiting but, but it's, so it, it's hand in hand with these women yeah so it seems like his, if he had an MO, the people he like scopes out are people related to him that he could like maybe get close to. Is that fair? Yeah, to say? that seems fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It always seems to be connected to either a family member, in law, business partner, lover, like, like just somebody... access- accessible people accessible. that have some sort of money. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, that's 100% uh-huh. right. So <sighs> Sandy is 
the woman he's sleeping with, also his niece-in-law. So basically what happened was the drag strip had begun costing more than Engelman had anticipated and he needed more money to funnel into the business. So he turned to Sandy and encouraged her to strike up a relationship with one of the workers at the drag strip, Eric Fry. So Uh he even orchestrated their whole relationship. So, so he's really going into this with intent completely. And he's like created from step one, like it's all a lie, like, like matchmaking for his own kill. 100%. So he's like, why don't you lure this guy, Eric into your, you know, use your wiles and get (laughs) him to marry you. Show an um, ankle. Show. Oh, well, that's pretty far. Em. I think that's pretty extreme. I wouldn't go sorry, that far. Sorry, 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 I know sorry. it's a little inappropriate for a show, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So he says, Sandy, why don't you strike up a relationship, get him to marry you, and then we can inherit money from his death. So easy. Sandy and Eric get Small married. Small potatoes. Get him to marry you. Get him to marry you. Guess what? September of 1962, they get married. Check. Next <laughs> stage, make it look like he accidentally died. Okay, push him in a well and blow him up with dynamite. Check. Wow. Uh, apparently it worked. He's a very oh lucky God. dude. Um, and that coupled with the fact that Sandy quickly had her husband cremated, uh, stopped further questions from authorities. And three months later, Sandy was $25,000 richer. And then she donated 16000 of that to the drag strip business to keep it alive. Wow. And also the like... When I think, so the first person that they killed was like worth like 600,000 in today's Mm -hmm. world. And what was, so you said 16 grand, this person was worth 16 grand to him specifically. Like when they split it, he got 16 grand. Yes. Is that 16 grand in today's money? No, that's um, 16 grand. Let me see what that was in 1963. So I was going to say like all of that work for like 16 grand see, is But that's exactly why it. people say, oh, you killed them for money. Like it doesn't really add up because yeah. it doesn't ultimately seem Like $600,000 isn't even a million dollars. I couldn't kill someone for, no. first of all, like not, not a million <laughs> yeah, dollars. Yeah, how much, M? Let's put it on record. <laughs> well, certainly not less than a million dollars. Like, you know, like. No. Anyway. So today, um, oh, is 142,000. Yeah. Are you fucking so like me? alone like, for your small business? Like, yeah. Like that's this guy. Okay. Yeah. I have my opinions and I don't think this was money based. Yes. It doesn't seem like it was purely financial. Like it wasn't like he was in a hard place and like he was desperate and this was the only choice. It was like, he orchestrated this. Although maybe it was like, a scheme within a scheme where he was telling people like he was telling like his ex or his niece like oh let's do it for money so that way they wouldn't realize he was doing it simply because he wanted to kill people well exactly exactly and then when later he says oh it was always for money people are like are you sure because it doesn't like it seems like an excuse that he's created to be like no it's normal I just wanted money it's like there's something weirder happening here. Like your hunting obsession. Like there's something uh-huh. like uncomfortable here. Yep. Um, that's exactly why it's kind of like nobody totally knows. Um, but yes, he claims it's for money. So she j- donates $16,000 to the drag strip business. Guess what? The drag strip had to close anyway, cause it wasn't enough money. So oh. it's like, after all that, the financial Very- upkeep was too high and it didn't even that Stay alone open. does it for me where it's like, oh, it wasn't even enough money to keep your business alive and Completely. yet it was still worth it. Okay. And it was like right afterward. It's not like it lasted a few more years. It was like right after that, he still couldn't make the money to keep it up and just closed it. So it's like, Jeez. wow, what a fucking horrible waste of human life for, Ugh. for a lame excuse. It's like 16,000 bucks. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Yeah. Again, we have another period of time where he supposedly doesn't murder anyone else. And that's a good point too, is like, as far as we know, he didn't murder anyone else, you know? So it seems like a time of relative peace. Who knows? Maybe something happened in between there that he just never admitted to, or we don't know about. So oh. no way to really know, you know, but yeah, uh, especially cause these keep being accidents. Um, but so he supposedly doesn't murder anyone else. His marriage to Ed or sorry, Ida ends okay. in 1965 when she finds out about his affair with her niece. And like his niece, because they're married. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. And during this time, Sandy, the niece, becomes pregnant with what could <gasps> potentially be Engelman's baby. We Jesus. don't know for sure, but like the timeline adds up. 
Um, so Sandy moves away to live with her grandmother and Engelman decides to get back into dentistry. He's like, let's get back to my hobby, my, or my career, I guess my career path. Okay. Um, I've spent enough time on drag racing and like, been, sleeping with my niece. I guess it's time. I've been putzing around. It's time to get back on track. <laughs> yeah, you know? It's time to get back to the real deal. My college degree, put it to work, dust it off. Um, mm. So he decides to throw himself back into dentistry and he marries his third wife, Ruth Jolly on April 15th, 1967. Mm-hmm. Um, and he seems to have settled into quite a simple, happy life. Uh, he, he's never suspected for any of these crimes. He's not even like on the radar. So it's not even like wow. he has like to look over his shoulder. He's just completely living Which, free. Like, and also I hate when the narcissist wins. Like That's, I hate, yeah. I hate when it's like, oh, wow. Like you were. You really did get away with it. Especially for something so stupid, like blowing someone up in a well. It's like you weren't even trying like, to be like uh, discreet. If that's how I go, every single person better be on the fucking yeah. trail to be like, where did that come from? Oh, wow. What an unfortunate accident. Like if where I go that way, might come from? if I go that way, people will be like, like, and I don't blame you. People will be like, yeah, that sounds like something she would accidentally oh, do. Oh, if so. you got blown up by dynamite, I'd be like, I don't know. She's probably like trying to hammer something into the wall and <laughs> it hit was, a landmine. It I don't was know. in her purse. She was looking for welding goggles. She accidentally picked up the TNT <laughs> and it's just a big mistake. I mean, that I get, but if M dies by dynamite, we got to look into it, everybody. Cause dynamite or hiking, you know, something's oh, wrong. No, like, yeah. You That's know, bad something. news. you know, it wasn't me doing it. You were there against your will. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, so he is living the dream. Um, again, he's like super popular in the neighborhood. He's a pillar of the community. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was noted that he began giving free dental care to people in town who couldn't afford it because he was just such a generous soul. Um, however, according to the podcast medical murders that I mentioned earlier, um, apparently he was also known to be a racist and was once investigated by the St. Louis civil rights commission for refusing care to a black woman. So Damn. as much as he's giving free dental care, he's eh, giving free dental care asterisk. Not really. Right. And right. he sucks. <laughs> um, okay, fair enough. Nine years later, he strikes again, this time with a new accomplice, his dental assistant, Carmen Miranda. Huh? So he's moved on from relatives to like, well, I guess employee. Well, yeah, he killed his first employee. Now he's working with his second employee. Um, he still has tabs on his cohorts. So let's put it that yes, way. Yes, exactly. And he seems to always have new cohorts, I guess, because he's killing them. But yeah, so he has <laughs> this new cohort named Carmen Miranda. And she is more than his dental assistant. But by that, I don't mean they're sleeping together. I know that's what it sounds like. But <laughs> Engelman's parents had taken care of the Miranda family during the 50s and 60s. And they had even lived under the Engelman roof for a while. So he had already... The okay. Engelman's family had already taken the, the Miranda family under their wing. So she was, all, it almost feels like she was already indebted to him a little bit. Got it. Um, because she like owed him for, you know, taking care of her family. So sure. I don't know if that ends up having anything to do with it, but it sort of feels like it. Um, he had also semi recently helped Carmen out by giving her an illegal abortion in the dentist chair because she couldn't find one anywhere else, understandably in the sixties in wow. Missouri. So, so she like really is like in <laughs> debt to him as yes. far as she might be concerned especially in a dangerous way of like she can't go to the authorities and say guess what i got an illegal abortion you know what i mean yeah, like it's already exactly. she's in a in a tight place because um he has something quote unquote against her as far as like the 60s go so um when engelman needed money desperately he turned to carmen and persuaded her to marry a telephone lineman called peter j holm and Carmen later revealed that Engelman suggested that I marry someone and that he would kill them in order for them to get money. So wow. just outright so, again. I was going to say, so he's just like, like blank, like, like point blank telling you like, oh, do this so that I can kill him. Yeah, precisely. Like there's no ulterior, there's no like. There's not like, oh, I met this guy and you two would really hit it off. And also yeah. like, I'm going to awkwardly push like you were dating, get rushed. And, and then I'll like subtly like, drop hints no he's outright like why don't you woo this man so that i can murder him and we can make some money but in which case okay well i no comment i would <laughs> finally finally i've done it what no i've never heard you say that before <laughs> just kidding um and they did it so 
On September 5th, 1976, Engelman was now 49. Um, Peter J. Holm was shot in the back with a rifle as he stood next to his wife in a wooded area. Wow. And guess what? What? (sighs) He got away with it because Carmen told the sheriff at the crime scene that this was a hit and run. Somebody ran by, shot him in the back and left. And she had no clue who it was, question mark. And so the sheriff wrote it off as an unfortunate accident. And that was that. It's like, really? Really? No one even asked like, oh, a hit and run. Like, was he involved in something? They never even investigated like who would have wanted to kill him. Okay. Or like, was she wanting to kill him? Like nothing. They didn't even look. So uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't really know. Carmen couldn't deal with her guilt in participating. And she was eventually hospitalized for depression, which um, she alleged came from this whole incident which like i don't blame you it seems like a lot um yeah also like to like to convince someone to marry you you at some point have to like put your guard down and realize like oh this person is actually being really nice to me and they really care and trust me yeah 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 yeah. there's got to be some sort of like at some point when they're alone i don't like maybe she did really feel like super in debt to this guy but it makes you wonder like was there a point where she could have been like let's like double blind him and I'm on your side and let's go get him like you know like yeah anything like pull out of this but again like maybe she was just cornered because of yeah who knows what he ha- had on her you know Ugh. so I don't I don't know how exactly like how indebted she was but apparently she didn't feel good after this incident um and Engelman what a shock didn't care uh <laughs> that her feelings were hurt quote unquote um he had a tax bill he needed to settle so he demanded that Carmen claim the life insurance money immediately and it was seventy five thousand dollars um and not wanting to deal with Engelman anymore Carmen had her brother Nick take over the insurance and Nick gave Engelman the ten thousand dollars and um today that's 47 grand so still not okay. like that much money for going and shooting someone in cold blood. And yeah, again, it's like hard to say. It's like, not that I think any amount of money is worth shooting someone in cold blood to be clear, it's definitely but not that number. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely not that number. Um, and so interesting that she had her brother involved because later the brother Nick ends up testifying against him. So just a heads up that like he ends up because she roped him now into this whole scheme. Um, he ends up with some intel on, uh, Dr. Engelman as well. So Peter Holm had literally just been shot and now Engelman was already planning his next murder. So I think that goes into the whole theory of like the shorter intervals. Um, or maybe that he's now going after people with less money. He has to keep doing it to actually make bank. That's true. He's like, wow, I already ran out. Yeah. That's a good point too. Um, Engelman had a new accomplice. He now turned to another employee named Bob. Um, and his name was Bob Handy, and he knew he could trust this guy. Guess what uh job description Bob Handy had? Uh he was a handyman. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine being born with that name being like, well, this is my destiny, I guess. Oh God. Well, <laughs> you know, so Bob- it's it's meant to be. I knew someone, I've mentioned this before, I think, but in college, I knew someone who was like in a, a, a poli sci major, wanted to grow up to be like a justice and their last name was justice. So they would be uh, justice, see, justice. And it's like, I mean, you, at that point, like you, it's meant to be, you gotta, you gotta lean into if it. If your last name is Baker and you don't know how to get me a cake, I judge you a little <laughs> bit, you know? And that's a really common one too. It's so the there should be a lot more cakes involved uh in this you're, world you're telling me i've seen you're very little cakes right. did you know i made a cake last night at like one in the morning did it look like your lumberjack one christine um was it that good was it, it worse did. it literally did look like it okay this is what happened how what were you this trying what, <laughs> what were you tr- what were you trying to do okay here's what happened i no, got no, really no 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 here's what happened <laughs> christine you the lumberjack one looked bad because it actually was complex this one looks like it was a simple chocolate cake (laughs) came out of a box (laughs) what did you do I got too impatient and it was in the oven not long enough and I was like well I still want to eat it and then it said wait for it to cool and I did it I just dumped it out and started putting frosting on it and it just fell in two million pieces Um, you were so horrible when it comes to like when the (laughs) The one rule is 
wait. Like I can't, you know, I can't, I can't literally, you had to wait two different times, wait for it to be in the oven, wait for it to not be scorching hot. And no. neither time did you learn you like, I what? can't something's it's, wrong with you. I know. I know. It's <laughs> like, I have, I have no ability to be patient. It's and I'm 30 years old. Like you'd think I'd have a better grasp. Of You're about ability. to have a baby. Get fucking I know. ready. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. Like I cannot even w- force myself to walk away and like count to 10. I can't. I just have no impulse control when it comes to stuff like that. So the that, that's about, where the cake is. is the best part about the ADHD though, is that I am just distracted all the time. So when I'm mad about having to wait five seconds later, I'm like, oh wait, here's another massive project I can focus on. And then I forget about the cake. And then I surprise myself and I'm rewarded with cake oh, at the end. And I'm like, I'm very okay. lucky. Maybe very I should lucky. just be more distractible. <laughs> well, ain't that the truth? Okay. Teach me your ways. <laughs> send me a, send me that picture of your cake because I really am going to need to judge you this for that so later. Embarrassing. You can even see the container of like store-bought $2 frosting in the background. Like it's not even like it and I I feel like in general I'm actually a pretty decent baker I know it doesn't seem like it but like when it actually comes to like real you know complex Christine what (laughs) oh Christine you know I will say I know it's not like completely cooked but it does give me like Bruce from Matilda cake vibes yes like and I'm you know kind what? of it, for it. It tasted pretty damn good. And I ate a lot of it because it kept falling apart. So I had to keep just putting it in my mouth. Um, so it sounds I ate like a good problem. But like it, okay. ew, Christine, you know, you know what I'm most grossed out about is like how you handled that jar of frosting <laughs> in the back. That, that so wasn't gross. even like part of the problem. And yet somehow the frosting is like a fucking disaster like, in the background. I already know your hands were covered in frosting. And you <laughs> oh, were just- it was just. You were just licking your fingers. It was in my right. hair. I mean, I'm like a fucking three-year-old. I like have no control. It's horrible. Christine, if, if you showed me that can of frosting in a couple weeks, I would be like, oh, your baby was eating frosting clearly. <laughs> How did you get the baby? Don't let the baby eat frosting. I know it's honestly, I don't know. I don't know. I have no control. I'm if sorry. I didn't, if I didn't know it was undercooked, that cake does look really fucking good though. That looks like the cake I wanted from Matilda. Thank you. It actually tasted pretty damn good. So for what it's worth, uh, listen, I didn't make anyone else eat it. So like, like don't make me eat it, but like, I will, I will longingly look at it. I okay. don't want to get sick, but I'll look at it. You know, no, it, it was cooked. I promise it was cooked. It just was too hot. You can't just, promise me that. I can't promise you anything. <laughs> I'm so full of shit. Um, Anyway, so when you say, where's the cake, I just couldn't help but tell you that there is cake downstairs, but it is. Mm. Well, let's just put it this way. That picture shows me that your last name is not Baker. (laughs) I know. That's why, you know, my last name actually means slate, uh, like roofing, but don't put me on a roof either. I don't think that's going to end well either. Um, So, you know, I think my last name, what's, what's Schultz mean? Isn't that like a landowner or something? Yeah. I feel like we've looked this up or we asked my mom. Um, I really shouldn't own land. So no, probably not. I just rent. So anyway. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it literally just means like you own a, a, a plot. Cool. I okay. know. Fun. Mine means slate. Okay. And Schaefer means shepherd. And I was always like, cool. My name means shepherd. And then my parents were like, no, it means slate. And I was <laughs> like, that's so fucking boring. Whatever. Okay. So I made a cake. Anyway, back to this. Um, <clears throat> so handy is a, Mr. Handy is a handy man. That's uh, kind of the moral of the story. That's, that's where we got. Yeah, that's where that's where we got derailed. Um, he was a handyman for the dental practice. And when Engelman and Handy grabbed lunch together in the past, Engelman confided in him about his murder spree. Which oh, I'm wow. Like, How do you end up in that position where you're like, I got to tell you something. Bob Handy has like a set of those eyes. I was just, about to say he's just eyes. warm eyes. You could just melt into and tell them anything. I mean, wow, you just lose yourself in those eyes. I bet you do. You just out of nowhere. You're like, by the way, I've murdered three people, you know, <gasps> gasp Th- three at this point. Uh, yes. Yeah. Three. Yes. And so, uh, Handy is like, instead of being like, uh, check please. And also your nearest phone booth. He's like, actually, I'm really fascinated. Can you tell me more? And so I don't know how this is this... how you and I met, by the way, yeah, Christine. That's right. that's I literally that's just right. told you about a bunch of grisly crime and you're, I was like, anyway, I'm sure this is the end of our friendship. And, you and went, my no, eyes no, no. just lit up, but I said, you went, keep going, come back, come back, <laughs> keep going. Yeah. So 
when Engelman confided in him, Bob Handy was like, actually, I'm really into this. And so Engelman was like, okay, well, actually I have the perfect opportunity for you. We're going to make loads of money. And Handy was like, all right, I'm in. So Engelman had an affair with this woman named Barbara Boyle and he convinced Barbara to woo after they had an affair together. He's like, I know that this has been fun and we're having such a romantic time, but I need you to woo this man named Ronald Goosewell and marry him. <laughs> um, wow. For me. This, this like a uh, plan really does work every time it seems. So he, at least for what it's worth, he's sticking to the plan that works. Like he's not mixing it up at all. Yeah. And it works. So she obeyed. Uh, she wooed this man named Ronald Goosewell and got married and Engelman prepared to strike. Hmm. So plans changed a little bit because Barbara revealed to Engelman that not only was Ronald Goosewell loaded, his parents were really loaded. Oh no. I know. So on November 3rd, 1977, Engelman and Bob Handy broke into Ronald's parents' farmhouse near, near Edwardsville, Illinois, where he shot both Ardner, Arthur, excuse me, and Vernita Guzel. Well, sorry. Both parents, he just shot them in their house. It's terrible. Wow. So despite a solid investigation, police ruled that this was a home invasion gone wrong. Womp Simple womp. as that. Wow. Simple as that. And a year later, Ron, who was an only child, claimed his parents' inheritance. So this is like a long plan this time. Wow. This was a real long term. He had plan. to marry this man for a while to get through to the end. And a year after that, at 11 p.m. on March 31st, 1979, Engelman was ready to complete his mission. When Ron was pulling into his driveway, Engelman and Handy ambushed him in his garage, pulled a 38 pistol on him then and there, and left his body in his car dead. Oh. And it took five days before anyone discovered the body. <gasps> That's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. And because he was like in his fancy car with cigarettes, they found coins and condoms on him. They believed he had driven to East St. Louis to hire a sex worker, which is like, because he had condoms on him, I guess. Wow. Making a lot wow. of assumptions here. Uh, but yeah, just because like, I mean, I don't know, like, well, anyone, uh, that has uh, a penis, I don't know. Like, I don't, I feel like a lot of people just have condoms on them. Like, I yeah. feel like that's very normal. And I get that he was married. So maybe they were like, well, it's not like he was using them with his wife, but it's like, well, he could have been, I don't know. It just seems like a lot of assumptions they're making. Yeah. But that's a lot. Are you kidding me? Oh my God. If, if someone found me in a car with a condom, I'd be like, I don't know. My friend left it in the car. Like that's just what happens. Like people Christine's have condoms. purse has a lot weirder things than condoms in it. You and she's know. not using them. She had a baby, <laughs> yeah. you know, Who knows where this came from? honestly, it's a mystery. <laughs> just leftovers. <laughs> so they found these condoms and cigarettes in his car and they were like, Oh no, he must've been up to no good. And so they basically just said, well, he must have just been in the wrong place at the wrong time at the wrong crowd. And that's how, why he was killed. So again, and literally nobody after several years has been like, Hey, this guy is slightly affiliated with every murder. We should go talk to him. Never. No one is doing their work over here. Like, I know it's like uh, what year somebody... did DNA come out? Like, or was like the DNA become <laughs> DNA like, it a... was invented. You know what I mean? When, yeah. uh, when like the people... late, like the early nineties. Oh, okay. Was first I was like in evidence. Oh, okay. I was like, damn, what is going on in the seventies? Yeah, no, it became like common practice in like the nineties, I think, <clears throat> or more common. Um, so Barbara then became heir to the Goosewell oil business fortune because she had married Ronald and was able to claim her inheritance and her husband's life insurance policy 17 months later, which totaled to 340,000, which today is 1.5 million. So eventually oh, he got his big windfall, I guess. <clears throat> and then did she split that evenly with him or did he get all 1.5 million? No, he did not get all 1.5. At this point, she's been married to this guy for th like three years. So I, wow. I would hope she got at least something, but um, she distributed some of it to Engelman and Handy. It doesn't say how much um, in any of the sources, but a portion she gave to them too. And luckily for Engelman, eventually suspicion raised around Barbara Boyle because mm. apparently she was the one acting a little too fishy for everyone's good. And she was arrested um, and convicted of the murder <clears throat> and her, uh, sorry, of the murder of him, her husband and his parents and sentenced oh, wow. to jail for 50 years. 
but she didn't fucking give him up. She didn't say anyone <gasps> was involved. Wow. Okay. First right? of all, though, if I were to scheme, that's a homie. Like that's, that's a good friend, but also like on the outskirts of that story, what the fuck? Like, why didn't you she know anything? Engelman wouldn't, wouldn't do that for you. you Not know? in a million years. So Apparently like, for like maybe a dollar, he like, are you kidding? Like he, for very little money, he wanted you to spend three years of your life. Yeah. Like, give you up for 1.5 yeah. million, not even all 1.5 million. Like he, this, okay. And I don't know, again, if he's threatening her, I have no idea, but somehow he is just this Enrico Suave that like nobody- Is he like incredibly handsome or something? So the way they described it, which I think I actually mentioned later, is like that he was just very, uh, um, what's the word? He, he had just, the eyes. Yeah, he had the eyes. I mean, I think he could just enamor women and like draw them in, which Ugh. always like gets me because I'm like, really? Like that? <laughs> I have yet to meet- many people i've maybe met like one or two people who like just by looking at me i i would do almost anything for well them. it's like just me right it's like kovu and you yeah <laughs> <laughs> christine as human drawing fanfic yeah um <laughs> I, it's really kovu as a human and you as a lion and it's just a, a weird <laughs> mishmash of that oh man i'd be such a cute lion you'd okay. be a very sweet lion <laughs> thank you dimples and you'd say all your s's <laughs> like z's <You're> crazy <laughs> I'd be like, it's the kookiest <laughs> lion of all. <laughs> all right. So she got arrested, didn't give him up. And that was that. So three years later, Engelman finally commits his last murder. So January 14th, 1980, 50 year old Sophia Barrera was killed by a car bomb. Wow. Another so, bomb. Another bomb. Um, so wait, what was the first bomb? There wasn't the dynamite. The dynamite. Yeah. I forgot about the explosion. Yeah. I, I wonder if he was like, that was the more interesting way to do this. I'm going to go back and yeah, do like it I'm again bored or of shooting people. I don't know. Yeah. So he went back to the bomb. What a monster what he did was 4 45 PM. She, Sophie left for work or sorry, left work and headed to a red Ford Pinto. And she hadn't clocked that something had been placed under her front left tire behind oh, it. Oh, Sophie. Awful. I know. So when she started the ignition and began reversing, it triggered the bomb and it went off and killed her. Um, and at the time it wasn't clear who was guilty of the murder right away, but finally Engelman was on the radar for this because they had actually started, um, they had actually had him eyed for the initial murder of James Bullock, which was that first one, which is where Edna's husband was killed five mm. months after they got married. Okay. And that was like 58 and now we're in 1980. So like they had him kind of on the radar for that. Hmm. So they didn't know about anything in between, but so since then, and now finally they're like, okay, this guy has another connection. We're going to bring him back into the circle. And the fact that <clears throat> Sophie Barrera was the owner of a South St. Louis dental laboratory to which Engelman owed $14,000 at the time uh, uh -huh. made authorities a little bit suspicious. So finally, finally, I know. <laughs> So Sophie, Sophie Barrera had even taken Engelman to court over the dispute. So like, this was a well-known uh, issue they were having with each other. Um, and Sophie's son knew this as well. And so Sophie's son was like, I know exactly who this is. It's this Engelman fella who's been like fighting financially in the courts with my mother for so long. At and least it's, sorry, at least it's like, um, I mean, I guess it comes from him being kind of a narcissist. Like he's gotten away with everything so far. Yes. Might as well like hit closer to home. You know, this is so much more obvious. I feel like yeah. than the last ones where he always had a middle person involved who, who did the dirty work yeah. uh, basically. So yeah, this was a very much a direct, like you're probably right. He probably just thought like, well, all the other ones worked. Um, so he was the main person who would have profited from Sophie's death. He was brought in for questioning, and although he refused to take a polygraph test, he chatted with the police for about three hours. And uh, in this interview, according to Medical Murders podcast, he rallied against Sophie, denied any involvement in her death. He claimed he would have won the lawsuit and even said, I'm not sorry she's dead. She got what she <gasps> deserved. <gasps> Fucking idiot. Oh, my God. Yeah. What a psycho. What a yeah. terrible, 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 terrible. Sorry to use that word. That should not be used out of medical context. That was inappropriate. But like, oh. what a horrifyingly inappropriate, terrible man. So he's a, dummy. he's a dummy. He's a dummy. That's a better word. Um, he 
was uh he unfortunately i guess maybe he was so narcissistic because he had an alibi which was that he was in his dental office the entire day of the bombing so investigators did let him go at first um and so he thought like well i'm off the hook but like i mean clearly they haven't caught him yet but at this point they're like well just because you were in the office doesn't mean someone else planted the bomb for you so finally they're getting to the point of like maybe someone else helped you out <laughs> like it only took several years to start wondering if maybe we should like really like not listen to just whatever the first story is yes really- like he's just in with his patients oh well like yeah exactly maybe he had help mm. so they decide to interview uh his wife ruth engelman <clears throat> and oh. according to court documents from murderpedia my favorite website uh, Ruth Engelman, who had since divorced, so I guess ex-wife, had since divorced, um, spoke to federal law enforcement authorities, gave them information about her husband's past activities as she now feared for her life. So huh. Ruth at this point is like, I got to give him up. <laughs> like this guy's messed up and I know it. Mm-hmm. So in what turned out to be a 56 page statement. Whoa. <laughs> I know. That's I know we talk a lot. <laughs> That's a book. Okay. It's a book. Ruth told the police everything she knew about Engelman's past and his murders. So in the court documents on Murderpedia, it says at the request of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms on February 14th, 1980, she wore devices to allow certain conversations between her and her former husband to be monitored and recorded. And during these taped conversations, Engelman acknowledged his involvement with Carmen Miranda in a scheme to obtain money and that he had received $10,000 from her brother, Nicholas Miranda, which was the one where he shot Carmen's right. husband at the woods. Um, right. So he's just like blabbing to his ex-wife, like about all these people he's murdered. I'm um, glad the cockiness is finally catching up at the very does, least. It, it usually does, or at least the stories where it does are always so satisfying. Yeah. Um, or at least you're like, he's getting sloppy. I don't know if he's getting yeah. like- cocky but he's definitely getting sloppy he's definitely like full of himself to an extent yeah um so he also told his wife he'd like to quietly settle down and practice dentistry for a little um and he said there's no possession on my part no driving urgency to keep getting rid of my fellow man which is like Um, so he's clearly on he has a complex about like uh it's not because i want to kill them right 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 right. why would you insist on that unless you did want to kill them Um, And so when Ruth pressed him for a reason for his murderous ways, he replied, money, 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 money. Uh, He also talked of a nice camaraderie that you have and closeness with the women who help with the killings. Oh, Oh, that's an interesting little. Right. So weird social twist. Yeah. He likes the the bond, the fellowship of it. Of murdering people and having like a secret with the women. It's like forcing them to trauma bond with you. Yes. Like it's, that's really awful. And interestingly, it's the women that he finds. So he's having women kill their husbands, which probably he gets it, off on. Yeah. Like, of to an like, extent. Mm-hmm. Oh, Ooh. so gross. <clears throat> wow. I feel like that answer was in front of us this whole time, but I never noticed. I know. It's kind of weird how it like suddenly fits. So it like clicks. It's like, um, oh, oh, you just wanted, to, you kind of liked watching like a relationship crumble or something. Yeah, the power of, of like being, being yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. controlling it and ugh, ugh. It's so gross. Like, it's like how narcissistic of like you want to be able to create something, mm-hmm. watch it be destroyed, and in the middle, convince the people in that thing you created. Like, it's like a really fucked up game of Sims of like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to build you up from the very beginning. <laughs> like get right in and infiltrate it with one of the people involved and destroy it from, and it was never really a thing to begin with if it weren't for me. And then profit off of it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And then like hold it against you. So you can't, and then when the woman goes to jail, be like, well, you can't tell on me. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's all very dark. Wow. So yeah, terrible. So with, they have evidence now of him literally saying, oh yeah, I killed Carmen Miranda's husband and made money off it. So they have this evidence now, at least. And um, he was arrested in February of 1980, not for the murder from a few weeks ago, but the murder he committed four years ago, which was the Miranda husband, because he admitted to that on tape. So it was like the husband at the woods. Um, So as Engelman had been caught, people who had involvement with the crime started to kind of coming up started to kind of come out of the woodwork and exchange information for immunity 
because again he brought so many different people into his schemes <clears throat> it was like bound to unravel yeah um, like put them all in one room by themselves and they're gonna put pieces together really quick exactly like it's gonna start falling apart and so Carmen and her brother Nick told all about Engelman's early murders. Bob Handy eventually admitted guilt and agreed to testify against Engelman. Um, so in Engelman's trial, uh, a partner of Engelman's at the Pacific Drag Strip named John Newton Carter, I'm sorry, Carter, also testified against Engelman in regards to the death of Eric Fry, you know, who was pushed down a well mm-hmm. and uh, exploded with dynamite. And Carter revealed Jesus. that Engelman admitted to killing Fry for the insurance proceeds. And I'm like, if you knew that, why didn't you tell somebody? Before yeah, now? I, it feels like a lot of people like chose on their own to be confidants for a really yeah. for very awful things. Yeah, like really awful. Like, hey, remember that guy who worked here? Guess what? I pushed him down a well and blew him up with dynamite. Anyway, yeah. have a nice weekend. It's happy hour. Like, what? it's like while well, you're gonna think like, oh, that guy's crazy. He just well, tells silly stories at the drag strip. No, anything goes. Like, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know where like where this like element of like, yeah, like you said, confidant comes from. Maybe he really was just that smooth and that slick that like, or maybe he really was like that like slippery that like when he would say things like you really couldn't tell if he was telling the truth or not. And yeah, people just kind of shrugged it off because they're like, there's no way that would really happen. Yeah, because he was like that charming or whatever. Maybe. Yeah. But that's another like sign of like his narcissism of mm-hmm. like, I could literally tell you to your face and you're not going to do anything about it. And he did, which is just wild. Mm. Um, so Carter was like, Yeah, he admitted to it. Uh Carmen Miranda supported the testimony saying Engelman had told her he had killed Eric Fry and divided the insurance proceeds with Fry's widow. Um, and then in Nicholas Miranda, who's the brother in his statement, he spoke about how Engelman had said during one of the attempts on Holmes life, um, which is the husband. So I guess, you know, when they shot him at the woods, apparently that was like not the first time they had tried to kill him oh. because the first time a dog barked at them. And so he and Bob Handy had to run away. Um, oh, okay. I thought for a like, second, like something like multiple traumas had happened to him and he no. was still like going into woods by himself and shit. <laughs> no, no, no. It was like, they had attempted it, but like the plot was foiled before it even started. Gotcha. Um, and Handy didn't even dispute this and just said, yes, we did. Like we did try that and it did fail and blah, blah, blah. So Ugh. during the trial, when thinking about Engelman's motive, um, it was obvious there was financial gain, but prosecutor Gordon Ankney drew everyone's attention to how all the crimes were quote sexual in nature. So huh. Ankney told the jury He says he does it for money, but I think that's a front. He never did it for enough to make it worthwhile. He related Mm -hmm. homicidal intimacy with sexual intimacy, which I was like, whoa, Whoa. that fascinating. That sounds like some criminal minds shit. Ooh, I I got got goose cam homicidal intimacy. I was going to say, I got some very sharp, cold chills. Yeah. Yuck. So that was fascinating. Oh, that um, makes total sense. Isn't that creepy and like fitting? Yeah. So homicidal intimacy with sexual intimacy, there was almost a sexual excitement about killing, which is probably why he was so adamant that like, oh, it wasn't about killing. Cause like he knew it was about killing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he's said to have quite a sexual drive. He has a very macho image of himself, which I'm like, you I don't would fucking agree. say. Yeah. <laughs> Kel surprise. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday, Blaze was like, "What does kill surprise mean?" And I was like, "Excuse me, <laughs> excuse me." I'm glad that you're listening excuse to the me. podcast. But what what are you saying to me the month before September? <laughs> what are you saying? Okay, all right, fair conversations between us must sound so dumb. <laughs> <Outsiders>. <laughs> what are they talking about? This weird German lady. <laughs> um. So, an article by the New York Daily News describes how Engelman was said to have a hypnotic way with the women. I was trying to come up with the word they used. It was hypnotic. Hypnotic. Um, and he would use that to coerce them into murder schemes. Mm-hmm. And with all this ten- testimony against him, Glennon Engelman was heading behind bars. And because he knew it, he fessed up to the murder of the Goosewell oil fortune family, including the parents. Wow. Um, which Barbara was like in prison for. Did she ever get like out for that? Um, not that I know of. <gasps> uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know, maybe eventually, but to kill three people for financial motives doesn't seem like something you'd necessarily get out for. So I don't know. Um, but it didn't seem like this was a, I feel like, like that was her destiny, which just sucks. Fair, fair. But I feel like she so quickly would be like retrial, please. Or like find a way to. Yeah. You know. I, I feel like if you're just fess up to him being involved, but who knows what he had on her or, I mean, I <sighs> guess if she, I guess during her first 
her original trial, if they said like, was anybody else involved? And she said, no, then she kind of wrote her. Yeah. She like kind of painted it. Yeah, exactly. Like she kind of set the, set it up to be just a solo. Yeah. I'm sure at some point she was like, damn, I should have asked for a retrial. If I'm like just sitting here and like, maybe I only get 40 years instead of 50 years, like some bullshit. Yeah, maybe. I mean, and honestly, I don't know. I should probably look it up. Um, it wasn't mentioned in the articles, but maybe, Sorry, um, not me to sound. I didn't mean to sound as shocked as I did. I was no, just like, I mean, I'm it's shocked a good she point. didn't ask. I'm shocked she didn't ask for a retrial. I mean, you could probably argue like I was coerced by this hypnotic man. Yeah, into doing this. I don't know. Oh well. Um. So he fessed up to those murders, and his sentence, which was going to be a double life term, then became a triple life term because he Ooh. added the Goosewell family to the murder victims. Sure. He was sentenced to another 30 years. Um, and he was never actually charged with that. The first murder, the bullock shooting his ex-wife's husband, um, really? which is odd because that was the one that they had already pegged him for yeah. in the beginning. But I guess he was just never charged with it. What, they, they were enough. like, they're like after three life sentences, like why even bother going What's through the this? Point? Which always kind of bothers me because it's like. That was still like someone's life. Yeah, exactly. Like that's still closure for someone's family or whatever. But, you know, I guess not. I guess he never got charged. Um, and Gordon Ankney, uh, he, who I met, who I quoted earlier, he also said most believed he was a kindly old dentist in South St. Louis, but he is a Dr. Engelman and Mr. Hyde. It's like, oh God. Interesting. <laughs> okay, Interesting I, creative license hmm, there. Yeah. You really went for it with that one. <laughs> he looked around the, the courtroom like, eh, anybody? <laughs> like, eh? eh? Hey, I worked really hard on that line. <laughs> <laughs> um, so March 3rd, 1999, Glennon Engelman, age 71, died behind Jefferson City prison bars due to complications from diabetes. Mm. And in the years prior to his death, his sister Melody had said to a source called UPI, he's just getting old, old and sick. He's lost a toe, lost it last year, and he has a hole in his neck. You can almost put a couple fingers in it, which is like, Whoa. oh, dear, goodness gracious. Oh my God. So we're in a rough time. Um, <clears throat> while at Jefferson city prison, Engelman refused to do many interviews, but in one of the rare interviews he did do, the reporter said that he was highly intelligent with an IQ near 140. He liked talking about parapsychology and signs of the Zodiac. <laughs> oh, well, sadly in another world, we might've been friends. With I was going to say, that sounds kind of like what we talk about. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he was also mightily cocky saying things like, let's face it. I'm a celebrity. Jesse oh. James, the Dalton gang and Dr. Engelman. It's like, nobody says that. Yeah. But. <laughs> yeah. Like, please tell me where you got that quote. Cite your source. Yeah. Say your source. Is it your brain? Probably Jesse James and the killer driller, you know, it's all, <laughs> okay. here we go. <laughs> oh my God. It's like, Ooh, nice try though, bud. Um, so yeah. anyway, that's the story of the killer wow. dentist who actually didn't kill people in the dentist chair, which is what it I sounds know. like. That's yeah. what I thought was going to happen this whole time. I feel like I did kind of prepare that with saying like, oh, he's dontophobia, a killer dentist. Mm-hmm. But um, no, it was just uh, on the outs. You know, dentistry was just his day day job. Well, now next time you're going to the dentist, you can wonder if they've committed some other acts, you know, don't ask them while you're there. Cause I feel like you're in a, in a vulnerable position in that chair. Um, don't ask them maybe. if they've ever watched Wiley e. coyote and gotten ideas, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if they know how to use dynamite. All um, right. <clears throat> do you have an answer to my, my, I do. Does earlier? this come out this Sunday or next Sunday, next Sunday? Oh, okay. Next Sunday. So next Sunday, actually, I've already said this, but it's the Ego Waffle Box from Stranger Things, uh-huh. 17 to 18 inches. Um, let's see what 80s nostalgia is. Um, it's a moon boot. <laughs> <gasps> moon boots. <laughs> wow. <pretty> <laughs> I, that's a moon boot is l- literally like an astronaut foot. That's, that's a, a massive that's a baby. chunky thing. Yeah. Uh, Uh, my cousin, when we were younger, this does not make me look good, but when (laughs) I was younger, my, uh, little cousin who like desperately was trying to impress me, which like, I was only like one year older, but I was like very fed up with her. And I told her she could only impress me if she skateboarded while riding moon boots um... while in moon boots. 
and she took one wrap around the cul-de-sac and she broke her arm and i feel really bad about it but <laughs> she broke her arm oh god any anything to impress me i guess which was so sad now in hindsight i'm like oh that's not cool but Has as a kid i was given you <laughs> I don't think she, rem- I, she remembers breaking her arm, but I don't think she remembers like the, the context of Someone's like about to me. Remind her. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows which cousin it is. <laughs> oh well, boy. She, she does. That's but, a challenge. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I remember her being like, hang out with me. And I'll like, I was like, I'll hang out with you once you moon boot skateboard. And then she didn't get to hang out with me because we had to go to the hospital. So yeah, you got oh. to hang out with her at the hospital. You, you know got the sh- ultimate. She got what she wanted to hang out with me. Just we didn't plan it to be in a hospital. Did you sign so. her cast? No. <gasps> em, you came up with that answer very fast. You didn't even have I, to think. Because I've thought about it. Uh, to be fair, no one asked if, I think uh, probably my mom and my aunt were mad at me. And so they didn't even let me like enjoy the fun part of a they cast. Didn't give you a Sharpie. It. I guess I wouldn't give my kid a Sharpie either. I'd be like, you don't have Sharpie privileges today. Especially like, I mean, it was like my aunt's kid. Imagine like Zandy's kid telling your kid, like, go break your arm and I'll be impressed. <laughs> you know, like, I think if you like, you Show don't get off to, to sign me. the cast. You don't yeah. get to sign the cast. That's a fair point, Em. You're right. You're completely right. Anyway, sorry. Anyway, should... on that note, I love these like fun little side <laughs> side stories. Um, so yeah, uh, wa- I go waffles and uh, moon boots. So uh, if like you learned tongue. anything today, uh, maybe avoid the dentist and also don't skateboard in movements. So yeah. And don't avoid the dentist. Cause you should probably keep your teeth, hi- dental hygiene in check, but if, if they're a murder suspect, maybe avoid them for like check a little them bit. On Yelp. Check them on Yelp first. Yeah. Maybe. Check out maybe ZocDoc and see what's going on. Just you know? check ZocDoc and see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And that's why we drink. Mm-hmm.